Hello, everybody. It is Wednesday evening. Welcome back to another edition of Field Gemology Talks. I am one of the hosts, Justin Prim, and we are going to have a great conversation and verbal adventure tonight with our guest, Armel. Um, amazingly enough, this is number 11, and we still have many more lined up. Uh, so if you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first time, then welcome. Um, if you haven't seen these before, this is our weekly event. We're talking with all kinds of people from all over the world who are basically all linked through Vincent and his field expedition. So all the people that you're seeing on the screen right now are all people that have either traveled with Vincent or have been Vincent's, you know, ground person contact. And so we've had a lot of great adventures over the last 11 weeks, um, a lot of stories, a lot of pictures. If you've missed any of them, they are almost all up on YouTube now. I think I think all 10 of them are up on YouTube now. And if not, the final one's coming up in the next day or so. And um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep on going um, as long as we still have stories to tell. So um, Vincent, if you're ready, we can we can get it going here and uh, see what we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm especially um, interested in this conversation. Uh, I think our mill. Hello. Hi, Vincent. I think our mill is maybe one of the only people that we've talked to in the whole series that that I knew already outside of you. Actually, um, I knew a I few of you. Met already, Richard. You. I yeah, think you know also Richard. Yeah, Richard as well. And I knew Terry, but I don't I didn't know I, yeah. I, yeah, I guess I knew a handful. But there's a lot I didn't know, but I feel like I did know our mill. And um yeah, and and you know, it's always fun to verbally visit Sri Lanka whenever we're still stuck on the lockdown. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, everything is okay. Had a a busy day uh, running from office to office uh, today in uh, in Bangkok where situation is, uh, well, not that bad, you know. Here, everybody wear mask, everybody uh, clean their hand uh, 20 times per day every time you enter a building or you leave one and try to keep, uh, you know, a bit of uh, social distancing. So in Thailand, uh, so far, you know, we cannot complain. Huh? We uh, yeah, Things are, so far are getting, uh, at least, well, you know, uh, Regarding the work we are doing, of course, the business is not really great uh, because uh, there are no uh, people uh, coming in the country or, you know, going from one country to another one is still a problem. For me, of course, uh, the field gemology uh, type of business is uh, totally dead because I cannot really go to uh, visit uh, gemstone producing areas around the world as I was doing before. So it's an interesting period where we have to think about... Uh, kind of uh, think Other, about new things to do. Yeah, you need new creative so, endeavors. And uh, of course, virtual field expeditions, I, which is, I guess, what we've been doing this whole time. Yeah, well, yeah, this is, well, we, of course, this is one of the things we do in order to keep contact with people, friends in the field, and, uh, and also the friends who are, you know, at home and uh, maybe uh, have some time to, uh, to spend. Uh, live or maybe later, you know, watching this webinar on YouTube. Yeah, this is uh, basically, uh, this is a contribution that uh, we are doing thanks to uh, the great uh, insight on a uh, motivating thing from uh, Rui, you yeah. know, who started uh, this uh, webinar and inspire us to, uh, to basically do the same and uh, uh, provide some uh, interesting uh, talk to uh, people around the world who uh, are willing to learn more a bit about what is going on in the field, maybe before, you know, in a few months or few years to travel themselves to these areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so far, we I'm just looking at the list. We really kind of traveled around the world from Australia to Afghanistan, all over Africa, Bangkok, um, and now in Sri Lanka. And, and so, yeah, we've, we've covered quite a bit. And it's not finished here yeah, because uh, there are still some... Uh, I have a three, four, four actually, four more webinars to uh, to go that are confirmed with uh, people uh, you know in the field. And we'll come back in uh, 
we go back in Africa. We are going also in the next few weeks, uh, come uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Okay. And uh, and then uh, there will be another one with geology, I think. Okay. Because they are kind of uh, popular. And uh, we'll see. We haven't then been... after that, we are going to uh, think about, because as I say, you know, we don't have uh, that many uh, people that uh, I know and I have a long history with. Yeah. Uh, we haven't been to the Americas at all yet, so I wonder if we'll eventually get there. If anyone, uh, we'll see. You got to pick your own brain for a while. So we're, we're going to be speaking to our mill tonight. What's, what's yeah. the backstory between you and our mill? How long have you guys known each other and, and, and what, what, what have you guys done? Well, we know uh, each other for about 15 years. Actually, I met uh, our mill thanks to the ICA, the International Cholestone Association. There was a congress in Bangkok in uh, 2005, the, fi the first uh, year I became a member. And at this time, uh, we were the young people. So 15 years ago, uh, there was a, a group of uh, seven or eight people that were uh, less, uh, let's say, than uh, 40. And, uh, well, less than 50, let's say. Uh, and, uh, no, less than 40, that's right, less than 40. And uh, we decided, you know, to uh, go around. And uh, during the whole Congress, uh, I spent a lot of time with Armil. And Armil uh, told me that if one day I wanted to, uh, to go to visit uh, Sri Lanka, he would be uh, very happy to welcome me and uh, help me, uh, you know, to, uh, to travel there. And a few months later, I uh, decided to start my uh, program, well, field geomorphology program, that I started with the AGS. And uh, actually, I... I took his word and I sent him an email and saying, well, you know, Amil, uh, if you don't mind, I would like uh, to uh, visit Sri Lanka in, uh, it was in April uh, 2005. And for him, it was not exactly the best time because he was super busy because actually he was organizing a visit uh, in Sri Lanka on a kind of uh, congress for the Australian Geomorgical Association. So he had already Okay. about uh, 50 uh, Australian geomologists uh, to take care. So he told me, well, Vincent, you know, if you don't mind, uh, there will be few Australians there. So uh, actually, if you want, you can stay at home and uh, there will be uh, some event. Uh, I will see with them if it's okay, if you can uh, take part of that. And there was a kind of a show where, you know, some Sri Lankan and Australian were showing things. There were some presentation. It was very interesting. So thanks to uh, that uh, nice uh, Australian uh, slash uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, event, this is the way I met uh, for the first time Chris Wood, oh. uh, my contact uh, in, uh, in Tasmania. We, we met at uh, Army Place in the morning at, uh, when we were taking breakfast because I think he was sick and he was uh, there. And, uh, and I met also uh, many other people, which was, uh, which was great. And then we, uh, Army, uh, helped me a lot on that trip because he provided me what was uh, what is probably the most important on any uh, field expedition for security it's uh, a reliable driver and uh, this uh, driver his name uh, his name is uh, sunil and since 2005 every time i go to sri lanka i'm using Sun sunil on his service so i'm still using the same person very reliable quiet guy which is a uh, very important when you see how crazy sometimes is a driving in Sri Lanka. <laughs> and uh, no, this is, this is great. So during that expedition with uh, Jean-Baptiste Seno, so we, we, in Sri Lanka, we really uh, were able to find the right system in order to, to go to the field. You need to have a private car, you need to have a reliable driver, you need to have somebody in the country who help you, you know, for the export and everything, and who advise you about where to go, put you in the contact with the right people when you go to the place. That was uh, Armil. Armil didn't travel with us, but he helped us, you know, at the back. We were in contact with telephone. He was providing me some key contacts in different places. And then we found a, a kind of a local guide who knew the people in the area, and we were able to go around. And on, on the way back, Armil helped me with the, with the export of my sample. Mm. And everything went very well. Great. And every time I returned to Sri Lanka, 
I visit Armil again, and uh, he's also regularly coming in Thailand. And so we meet each other very regularly at uh, ICA event uh, in Sri Lanka in Thailand. Yeah. And actually, uh, Armil and Sarah and uh, their daughter are my uh, kind of uh, Sri Lankan family now. You know, we are 15 years of uh, regular uh, relationship, which is great. It's a good, good, uh, good backstory. Well, shall we bring him in and, and uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. have him tell some stories? So, Armil, if you're ready, come on in, uh, start your video and audio. Welcome. Good evening. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent, for having me here and also for the kind words. Uh, and uh, like you said, from ICA in 2005, starting in Bangkok, uh, then you traveling to Sri Lanka during the uh, GA um, April. trip. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, it, it was, I think, a memorable time. And <clears throat> we, we actually had 135 Australians in town, uh, um, just over 50 uh, gemologists and other dealers. Yeah, uh, my cousin Grant Hamid was uh, the Victoria president. Uh, he's now the chief examiner for GAA. So he was instrumental in planning and bringing, that, uh, bringing all the Australians to Sri Lanka in 2005. I can't imagine trying to house that many people in Sri Lanka after being on a way smaller trip than that through Sri Lanka with just 20 people. It was very hard to find hotels big enough for that big of a group. I can't imagine 50 people plus Vincent, you know, <laughs> obviously the rowdiest of all. Um, but so um, do we have... A, anything okay so uh our mill then let's just jump straight into to oh, the story maybe we have okay maybe <laughs> we, i have a hard well not yet maybe we we go with the first question and then maybe we'll see maybe we okay so our mill yeah. um can you give us a little bit of well, we heard a little bit about you from vincent but can you give a little bit more of your own words of kind of your own backstory and and you know where where you came from and, and how you got to the place where you're at today uh, uh, in, the, yes. in, in Sri Lanka and in the world. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so my family's been in uh, been rooted uninterruptedly in the gem and jewelry industry for five generations now. So uh, I was born into the family that has been firmly rooted in the gem industry in Sri Lanka since 1890. So my childhood was filled with unusual toys and entertainment. We used to play games in my father's office where the table would be filled with star sapphires, blue star sapphires. So it used to be large parcels. So you'll find thousands of carrots just sitting under a spotlight. And as children, we were like super excited because we'll see the, uh, when we move these stones, the stars would start to play, uh, move around. So this was super interesting and the game was to find the best star. Uh, so some days, uh, and some days when we were traveling through the country, my grandfather and my father would meet a fellow trader and they would often found, uh, start trading just there. They'll stop the car in the side of the road and they'll do uh, you know, negotiations sometimes for hours on a stone and then a final transaction I, I'm not sure whether you have seen it, uh, Justin, would be under a handkerchief. So they would have their hands, uh, both both the, uh, my father or grandfather and the trader having uh, hiding their hands under a handkerchief and with no words uttered, they would finish the transaction. Okay. So this is, uh, although this may sound very unusual for most people, it was my reality. And uh, so the reality kind of runs in my blood. And uh, I, I was also never a conventional learner. And this is, I think, the core of my business even today. Uh, so to enable others experience gemstones, feel them and live them, not just read about them in a book or learn in a classroom. I think most of uh, us know that once we finish the classroom, we really need to get out there. 
So let me take you a little bit on my journey. Uh, it's a story of risk, relationships, immersion, and legacy. I will show you uh, or share with you uh, what it is actually, what it means, and how the foundation was built. Okay, I'm excited. I know um, the time that I met you, that was my first time in, in Sri Lanka, and it was a totally unexpected meeting because I didn't know who you were at the time, and, but you knew my wife. And you, you, know, you called Victoria, we were in the car, I forget what we were doing, and you just said, come to breakfast or lunch or something. I was like, who are we meeting? Who is this guy? And then that was, an, that was a whole adventurous weekend just from a random Instagram. I think you saw us on Instagram, like, oh, they're here. Or maybe we, I don't remember how it happened, but. That's right, yeah. So yeah. let's do another adventure right now. So, um, well, let's, let's. The video is ready. Oh, perfect. It worked. Okay, so before we get into the story of Sri Lanka and gemstones and our mill, let's visually uh, see, for anyone who's watching this who hasn't been or doesn't know about the beauty of Sri Lanka, let's see a bit of this video from uh, Vincent's previous expedition. So this video that uh, I will show you is a video from a recent expedition I had uh, with the army in Sri Lanka. At this time, I was working with the GA. So you will see it was when I was uh, traveling with uh, my team. There are some people that you might recognize, like a whim that uh, I was and uh, I was uh, training at this time, plus uh, some other friends. And uh, we met, of course, uh, Armil, and we went to Beruala when we were witnessing the market. And uh, Armil was in Beruala, and he helped us uh, with uh, dealing with uh, the stone and the brokers in Beruala. It was kind of an interesting uh, visit. So you will see the video that, was, that we did, I think, in 2015 when we had uh, about uh, 10 days around uh, Sri Lanka. This is uh, GA field expedition number 74 to Sri Lanka. This will be about a two weeks long expedition that will focus on a blue sapphire from Sri Lanka. We are going to Beruwala, where we'll see the main market that is taking place every day between 10 and 12. You can buy any, any stone you can buy, but uh, no problem. Some business happen in the street, but most of the people, most of the foreign buyers who are coming in Sri Lanka, go to see stone in an office. In Beruwala, you would find a lot of uh, faceted or finished goods. Sri Lanka, it breeds sapphires. Everything here is sapphires. Um, if you look around you, you see colors that are matched in the best quality of sapphire. There's peacocks everywhere, and you see perfectly blue sapphires everywhere. Kataragama is an interesting deposit because there was a discovery, a rush in 2012. Now they are cleaning the surface. Now they can, you know, uh, take the illam from there. If you find a low quality sapphire like that, it means that possibly you will have some uh, better quality stone later. At least, you know, this is a good spot. There are sapphires. So what is interesting here in uh, Karoita is we can see in the same mine a team of miners using the traditional mining technique developed in Sri Lanka over several hundred years and also the mechanized mining technique developed in Australia during the 1960s. Very few people know that there are also a lot of large-scale mechanized mines here in Sri Lanka 
that are contributing a lot to the production of sapphire of the country. What is very interesting in Ratnapura a region is that this place is very, very unique around the world because I don't know about any other place where miners have developed a, such a technique in order to mine gemstone in areas full of water. Something very specific I've seen in Sri Lanka, it's uh, mining under paddy field because it involves a lot of skills. You need to build some structure. I was really, really impressed. They are building these square pits that are going down with big piece of wood, bamboo, and fern. So it's strong enough to hold the mud, but flexible enough to be able to move with the earth. How is this feeling right now? Uh, the feeling that your life can stop at any moment <laughs> feels good. Feels good. You can appreciate things differently. This is very clear that extracting gems from artisanal mines it's really a battle against the elements. We're here surrounded by earth, 12 meters underground. There's water attacking us from all sides and trying to get out. There's, an, uh, there's, an, uh, there's a tube here that brings in the air, so it's a constant battle against the elements, water, earth and air, to try to win the battle and take home the prize, which are the, the gems. So cool. I think one, one thing that the video doesn't really communicate is how hot and steamy it is when you're down in the mine. I know I went down the last time I was there and did a video. It is an awful place to, to shoot a video. It's really wet, it's hot, and it's muddy, and it's very hard to keep the camera clean because you yeah. have to climb down the ladder to get there, and then your hands are all dirty. I can tell you, I lost one camera in this mine. There was, it was so <laughs> humid that uh, one camera I was using to take photographs just died yeah. because there was too much moisture. Yeah. So Sri Lanka, I lost one camera. Thailand, I lost one camera. Madagascar, I lost one camera. Tanzania, I lost one camera. It's a kind of a tough job for cameras, yeah. So maybe if you all spend, the... uh, like we did, about uh, 45 minutes underground. It's hot, very humid. It's, uh, it's not easy, but actually, these mines are just uh, fascinating. This is, uh, for me, this, the mine in Sri Lanka, the ones that are in the paddy field, that can go sometimes up to 60 meters deep. They are just incredible because... The Swedenkan over the century have developed this technique to mine under the water. There is water, you know, filling the mine all the time. Yeah. But they just remove the water. You know, they have a pump, they remove the water, but with the fern on the, the way they build the mine with, uh, with wood, there is not one nail, there is no metal. They are not using metal. They, they have this technique to, to build the mine just with wood. The, the people, the miners, know exactly which type of wood to, uh, to use, how old should be the wood, how many uh, years you have to keep the wood, you know, to dry the piece. And every piece, every, every step of, the, of uh, building this mine is the result of uh, many years of experience. And some of the team, uh, you have, in, in all these teams, you have people with 10, 20 years of experience. This is... Uh, this is really something that is uh, just amazing. And so far, I don't have seen that anywhere else than in Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah, really impressive. So Armel, can, before we get into much of your story, can we, can we get some idea of you, from you, of, um, you know, a little bit about Sri Lanka? You know, like I know, and I know Vincent knows that Sri Lanka has been in the trade probably as long as anybody, you know, thousands of years. Um, what, what's, what's the trade like now? You know, I know it's very multifaceted. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the different things that are going on? You know, we saw in the video a little bit about the mines and the markets, but I know there's a lot more than 
just those two things. So, you know, from your point of view. Yeah, so uh, uh, we have uh, we have the miners, then we'll have the traders, we have the cutters, then now, I mean, in the last 30, 40 years, we'll have the people doing the heat treatment, uh, heating of the sapphire, uh, but, and then uh, the cutting and polishing. So there are all these different segments. This is part of the supply chain. But if you look at predominantly all the mining is in an area called the Sabaragamu province, mm -hmm. where most of the mines are, uh, Ratnapura, Palmadul, Balangoda, all these areas. And uh, so the most of the mining is done by the people in that area. And then uh, in the south, we have Gaul, Beruala, uh, where a lot of the traders settled down from, uh, uh, from the past, right? From hundreds of years ago. So the, the, the people who actually traded were not the people who first initially mined. And that was where uh, cultures will say uh, predominantly the Sinhalese who were uh, the miners to the Muslims uh, who were the traders. So they, the, they were very, uh, I mean, they worked together hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so two different ethnicities working, uh, you know, in the last so many yeah, hundreds of years to do this trade. So this is a very interesting aspect of the culture and both of them respecting each other's ways of doing things and their life and the way they do things. And uh, even today, uh, uh, we have a very good friend from Ratnapura and uh, as a joke at the end of the sentence, he might speak in the Tamil language, which is mostly spoken by the Muslims, although he's a Sinhalese himself. Okay. So there's a, there's a lot of basically interplay between these two cultures, even from then until now? Yes. Yeah. And then, sure. yes. Vincent, you had something to say? No, 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 I see. Yes, for sure. So, you know, Beruwala is, a, is an interesting city. This is the, the main uh, trading city in, uh, between uh, uh, Colombo and uh, Gaul. And actually, Beruwala is coming from uh, Berber. It's coming, the, the people who founded Beruwala, from what uh, I, I discussed and I, I did a little bit of uh, search in history, it was founded around the 8th or 9th, uh, around 9th century, 10th century, by people that were coming from Northern Africa, from uh, basically uh, uh, Algeria, Morocco, all this area, who uh, traveled to Sri Lanka and started to trade with Sri Lanka. So you have the sapphire trade basically is globalized, as we can say, international in Sri Lanka for more than uh, 1,000 or 1,200 years. At this time, after, you know, the Arabic conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean and things like that, the, basically the, the Muslim were the traders between Sri Lanka and uh, Europe or Asia. You had... Uh, Muslim traders going uh, east to China and going west to Europe. So, and they were collecting stone uh, in Sri Lanka. They were buying stone from the miners and they were selling them abroad. And this is uh, the way things are going for about uh, 1,000, maybe 1,300 years. Yeah. Yep. And so I just, pull, I just figured we should pull up a, a map for people who aren't super versed on... <laughs> Sri Lankan uh, geography. So, as as our mill was saying, you know this this mining region is this area, and then and then Vincent was that's talking the main about, one. Yeah, Indeed, and then, that's the main one. And then you have and Berwala you have and, the, and Gaul. You have Berwala, and then you have Gaul in the south. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it's mainly on the western uh, west, western coast. Yeah, on the it's, eastern coast, you have uh, in the southeast, you have this uh, big uh, green spot. That is the Yala National Park, probably one of the most famous national parks in Sri Lanka. And just next to Yala National Park, you have Kataragama, that is also a sapphire deposit. Okay. Sapphire producing area. There okay. was a big rush in 2012 in that area. And then, so, and then, you know, when we're talking about these, these Muslim traders from 
you know, eras gone by, Barawalla was one of the, Barawalla and Gaul were the kind of the shipping ports that they were doing the trading at, right? Is that, is that how yeah. Barawalla became such a prominent gem city? Because that was the seaport? Yeah, well, uh, actually the main seaport were more like a Gaul or Colombo. Okay. But uh, in Barawalla, that's more like a small fishing port. And uh, the people from Beruana are very not very far actually from Ratnapura. So yeah. they go regularly to Ratnapura and uh, the area, especially a place that is called Niwitigala, where you have a gem market selling rough stone. Every day you have a gem market in uh, Ratnapura. And every Wednesday you have a very important uh, rough market with the Geuda Safaya in Niwitigala around uh, 7 to... Uh, yeah, seven o'clock to nine. And then people from Beruwala and from Ratnapura go there to buy the stones, then they return and they bring the stone to uh, Beruwala that is starting maybe between 10 and 12. So you have a market early in the morning for Geuda and then you have the regular market in uh, in uh, Beruwala on, uh, in the afternoon. But in Iwitigala, this is mainly local people who are... Uh, working there, except few Thai uh, buyers, but in uh, Beruwala, you have a lot of foreigners going there to buy. Uh, actually, these days, sapphire from everywhere around the world. Amil? Yes, correct. It's a very intense spot. Uh, I think Beruwala now has uh, become an international market because we have the material coming from around the world. Uh, and uh, most of these people are having uh, a good knowledge about the rough stone uh, of uh, how to process it, how to manufacture it, what kind of uh, uh, heating that needs to be done, whether it's on a ruby or a sapphire. So that's a very interesting thing, like uh, Vincent mentioned. It has become an international hub. When we um, opened our offices in Beruela, of course, my from my grandfather's time, we've been dealing with Beruwala. He used to walk the different streets uh, in, inside the Beruwala city, which is the China Fort. And uh, so uh, the, it has uh, changed from maybe 20 officers in 2003 to over 150 officers where people can come sit and trade uh, in the polish, uh, cut and polish goods. Wow. So it seems like to me, and especially f compared to some of the other places that we've kind of looked at in this series, Sri Lanka is kind of interesting because there is pretty much every step of the gym trade from mining to heating to cutting to uh, trading. Almost everything is happening inside of Sri Lanka. How interconnected are all of these steps? Are they all different people or do some people have maybe, you know, multiple roles in the Sri Lankan trade? So just to uh, take, uh, take you back to a small experience as part of culture and maybe even as rite of passage. Uh, uh, at 17, as rite of passage, my took, dad took me to Ratnapura and left me to experience it alone. Uh, it was a full immersion for two days and a very in a very uncomfortable zone. Yeah. Uh, well, now I know I grew by character and experience in this zone. I had a uh, fun experience and one even life-threatening situation uh, at this point. But uh, that is a story for another day. I moved to Ratnapura. Uh, it's also known as the city of gems in Sinhalese. So I could fully immerse myself in the gem trade. Um, so some of my experiences, I would wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning um, and then uh, head out to the different local markets. Of course, when I started out, uh, by 12 p.m., Ratnapura would come to a complete shutdown. Uh, we still had a small marketplace in Talmadulla, uh, which was an after lunch. But beyond that, uh, everything shut. So we worked only those hours. And so uh, there were times that I would buy well in the different markets, uh, would drive maybe anywhere from about 100 to 400 kilometers a day um, and trying to buy something. So 
uh, buying some some days well, other days not so well. And it was these times that it truly helped me understand that uh, you know it's not given, and you have to learn and progress. Uh, so if I some bought something badly or the wrong price, then what I would do is before I went home, I would try to sell it back in the same market. Um, so that uh, you know, I make my money back. Uh, so these are some of the experiences. And basically, after my, after my dad left me behind for two days, uh, the bus ride back to Colombo was uh, a reflective one. <laughs> so these are some of the experiences I think a lot of them go through. Mm. So uh, in terms of the the uh, cutting and the uh, mining aspect, so you would learn from your elders it could be your uncle uh, who has inspired you it could be your father it could be it uh, maybe your father wasn't in the business or your grandfather was a cutter so there were so these were some of the uh, things uh, people were inspired by and that was part of the uh, reason why uh, people looked at it uh, from learning from their elders okay. now from the miner to the cutter uh, to the trader uh, and sometimes now the day trader would buy a stone in the morning and sell it. And the profit would be a very uh, negligible because they're trying to just make a day's living. So because mm -hmm. of they know how to look at a stone, so they might buy something for, we'll say, $50 and sell for $55, okay. right? So there is sometimes a question people ask, the chain of custody or how many people it went through. but in terms of uh, reality, it could be somebody bought it for fifty dollars and sold it for forty because he needed his money back that day. So okay. the same process which I went through, where you know if I had bought wrong, I would try to at least settle it or take a small loss where I was given that leverage uh, would be a part and parcel of my learning and the actual business as well. And so. Uh, Antoinette Matlin's in the in the audience asked, can you give an example of buying badly? Like, what does that actually look like for you? Or at that time, at least? Uh, so I, I remember um, I, I had a, uh, my uh, one of my father's partners uh, at one point in Sri Lanka, and he, he had sent his Japanese uh, son to learn uh, the ground situation. Uh, because they were one of the largest manufacturers of platinum jewelry. And uh, he was teaching me Japanese. I was teaching him Sinhalese. Um, I was teaching him gemstones, and he was teaching me uh, about Remy Martin uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the best uh, best brandy in town. So, But at the same time, we, we once we were trying to uh, uh, understand what we had to buy, and we bought a fairly large stone at uh, maybe a price where it was almost 30 to 40 percent. We were wrong in the purchase of what it would become from a geoda to a nice blue sapphire. So the mistake was not really the cutting aspect of the stone. We knew how many carats it would come, the yield and so forth, and where the table would sit and uh, where the culet would be and all that aspect. But we uh, misjudged the color. Uh, so the pricing, the final pricing for export would be completely off. Mm. So that was something. So it could be that. It could be by uh, a much smaller margin. But it's also understanding, okay, uh, can I use this for business? Uh, or can, is it, sometimes even if you buy maybe right or wrong, uh, at a particular price, you might find a customer who, who is willing to pay you than the basic market rate. So you so you, you are in that environment, you have come across a beautiful five carat sapphire or a 10 carat sapphire or a 50 carat sapphire. And at that point, you have to make that decision. Do you buy it, right? Even if that is not the going rate and you believe that you have a customer who you can uh, pass it on to, who would appreciate it at that value. So then obviously the lessons that you learn from your elders is going to become very important for you to be able to be successful in this situation, right? Like obviously I've seen what the markets are like there and they're chaotic 
I mean, maybe if you've grown up there, they seem familiar, but there's so much happening all around you that it seems very easy to make a bad choice, you know, accidentally find a synthetic or, as you said, you know, misjudge a color. Um, and I, I know for you, your, your family was in a lot of different aspects of the business, right? Like your father had, was doing some cutting and also trading. So were you really exposed, you know, by the time he left you in Ratnapur, did, did you really know a lot about cutting and rough and also heating at that time? Or were you still just starting to understand? Um, I I didn't know uh, I didn't know anything Justin at that time. Okay. So uh, so and I didn't know I was going to be left behind in Ratnapur either. So <laughs> it was a shock when at uh, uh, 5 p.m. when he got into the car to leave and he said, "Hey Amil, you know what? I've arranged because I couldn't buy much stones today. I've given some money to to the place where I was staying to the person who was supposed to mentor me and uh, show me the ropes. Uh, so." Uh, I've given him some money. Just uh, make sure you buy something. He'll he'll guide you. So buy buy a few stones, uh, and uh, I'll come pick you up on Sunday, which he never did. Uh, I had to take the bus back home. <laughs> so uh, so that's uh, so that that's been thrown in the um, in a zone that you are out, out of your comfort, and that I think even today I still remember, and that was interesting to learn, and that's a learning. Do you think, uh, will you try and do that to your children as well? Is that going to be how you throw them into the business? I, I think today it's slightly uh, different. It's, it's not that uh, it's not, it, it, that approach is right or wrong. But uh, I think uh, today's uh, the kids and generations uh, think and do things differently. So... Uh, for them, it might be actually, oh yeah, let me let me check this out, <laughs> and they might not be in an uncomfortable zone either. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I, I was yeah. I felt uh, intimidated the first time when I went into the market, both in Ratnapur and Barawala. I mean, maybe also just being a foreigner, you kind of know that you're you're out of place. But there's just a lot of people who seem to know each other, and you don't know any of them. So to me, even at, at 17, that seems especially intimidating. But Obviously, you survived, so you're here yeah. to tell the tale. Um, yeah, I, I want to uh, jump on something that uh, Ami say. He, people have to understand that uh, buying sapphire is one of the most uh, tricky uh, things that uh, you can do, because uh, okay, Ami say that he made basically a mistake because he was not really he made a mistake on the the color of the stone. Because he had to basically imagine what will uh, this stone become after heat treatment. And if you don't know about heat treatment, if you don't know that this specific type of sapphire will turn like that or like this, basically when you look at a piece of rough, you are gambling. If you are not a cutter, if you are not a burner, or if you don't have a good experience in this two-step, if you buy a stone that need heat treatment in order to uh, get the right color. And then you have a cutter who will look, he will study where is the color located because in sapphire you have color zoning plus dichroism. So you have dichroism, so you have one direction where the color will be nice, and then you have color zoning. So the cutter, when the color is fixed, he will look at the stone and he will try to maximize the beauty and the value of the piece. So when you have, when you go to a place like uh, the market in Niwitigala, where you have rough geuda, most of the stones that are there will require heat treatment in order to become blue and transparent and, uh, and nice. And if you go there and you try to buy and make some profit, and if you don't know anything about heat treatment, you don't know anything about cutting, you are gambling you are gambling twice. Yeah. So the, the you know it's super complicated actually to buy sapphire. You need to have uh, if you want to buy rough stone. My advice: learn how to cut. Because then, okay, from this rough, I will get that. And this, the result, the resulting stone, 
uh, an oval, uh, two carat, this color, this shape, and things like that. I think I can sell for this amount. Then you know your cost, and then you know what is the maximum price you can pay to buy the stone. Yeah. But if the stone needs to be uh, heated, then you have to think about how much it will cost you to get the heat treatment done and what will be the result. Yeah. So it's a multi step uh, guessing that uh, involves quite a lot of risk. And then there is another thing with sapphire. It's maybe when you look at a piece, uh, at a, a rough stone, maybe that stone was already heated and you don't know. Because I have seen that regularly. You have uh, people, you know, they buy a stone and then they try to heat and the stone doesn't react very well. So they will return the stone to the market. Yeah. They will sell the stone for cheap to uh, some guys who uh, want to do whatever. You know, they will resell the stone in the market and then the stone will return in the market and maybe, you know, after three or four new guys, this stone will return to the market in Newity Gala and then this stone will go around. And of course, the information about the fact that this stone was heated will be lost. Yeah. Or maybe some guy will just transmit, uh, not say that to the next uh, guy, who will, and uh, you might end up in front of you with a stone that was already heated. Maybe of course, even, it will not change much. Maybe it will so, heated more than one time. And then I don't speak about the synthetics and the imitation and things like that. Yeah. So it's, when you go to a gym market, if you don't know what you buy, well, you should uh, not complain if you uh, basically uh, miss, uh, miss something. And I think that it was a lesson that uh, maybe your father wanted you to get. If you don't know what you buy, you are in trouble and you are nearly sure that you will lose. Yeah. So then you have to learn about, uh, about the stone learn about the cutting, learn about the heat treatment, learn the different steps, and then you will be able, uh, with uh, a lot of knowledge, you will be able to uh, maybe to start uh, buying stone and uh, make a profit. Yeah. And so, Armel, um, another guest, Anthony Pinto, asked, uh, and, I'll, and I'll amend his question a little bit. He said, how do you go about starting a wholesale trade for gemstones with no experience? But I kind of want to modify that and say, can you start a wholesale business with no experience? Is, or, or do you really need, you know, whether it's your, your relative or someone to guide you through the first steps of, of the trade? How, you know, how, how do you get your start from your experience? <coughs> Uh, yes, actually, there is an opportunity. Uh, today, we have so much of information. When Vincent first came in 2005, and then uh, the, on his following trips, I was like, Vincent, what are you doing? And it was really confusing to me because uh, I was trying to understand the aspects of field gemology, uh, how um, uh, Vincent was finding out, okay, where it came from, the location, the GPS, right? And uh, so it was a very interesting aspect to that. And uh, so to understand it and say on the wholesale side of business or to start a new business, there are tools today that uh, wasn't available to people. Like right now, we are on a discussion and conversation from around the world right, on a Zoom call. So similar to this, I may come from uh, five generations of business, but actually almost every year, I feel like a startup. I feel like I'm starting all over again. And because the, the systems, the way we do business, um, everything's changing, the marketplace. Like, for example, um, there, today there's a requirement for what they call a teal sapphire, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, five years ago, if I found a teal sapphire, I'll throw it back, throw it back in the pit, <laughs> right? Even if it was a 20 carat or a bigger stone, right? Because there was no marketplace for it. So it's all changing. So it's interesting. So to answer the question, uh, if you can have the knowledge, but it's not easy to, I mean, if you are going to be the buyer, 
if you are going to be the cutter, if you are going to be the supply chain management, right, then you can't just walk in and say, I'm going to ho- open a, a wholesale business tomorrow, right? Yeah. But uh, if, if you want to bring the right people in, like Winston uh, also says, uh, it's about having, or, or we all can say that, it's about having your trusted partners. So it's about relationships. It's about like, for example, uh, going even today. Uh, I mean, I don't know this information, but uh, sometimes if I'm sitting in the office in Beruala, my father would start talking to the uh, supplier about uh, what's his name, why, who's his father, and he'll tell him where he lives, right? Out of the hat. He'll pull out the address and he say, you doubt live next to this one's house and this and this. And then then at that point is when they'll pull out a stone that they were not going to show you, right? Uh, which they felt, oh, you are not the buyer for it. So these are things that is the part of the traditions and the culture of uh, the Sapphire trade. And so breaking those barriers are bigger than finding just the finances or trying to find come down to uh, Sri Lanka, go down to Ratnapura and buy a fake, a fake or synthetic stone near the mine and go back to Paris or New York and try to sell it. Or, or even if you do today, to be honest, uh, even, if you, even if you come with a capital to Sri Lanka, you buy gemstones and you just try to turn it around and you knock on doors wherever with dealers, they already have their supply chain in place, right? So they don't really need somebody to knock on their door and also at some time point becoming become a competition at some point, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, so the, the way the business works is for you to have a plan, have a good business plan. You can become a millionaire, right? Like what happened in Kataragama, Vincent knows uh, he was down here within a week uh, to cover uh, the uh, gem rush in Kataragama, right? Uh, it they were uh, there was a road project they were doing doing up a road and it suddenly rained one day and there was sapphire uh, across the road and there's so many villagers who who suddenly became uh, entrepreneurs who took this soil home to wash it uh, and uh, they some of them did become millionaires overnight right mm-hmm. so you could become uh, the word wholesale dealer that curtain may be coming down now so it's about transacting, whether you can call it B2B, even B2B, there's, we'll say, five tiers. Then you have your B2C. Then you have age to age, consumer to consumer. So getting in the business today is much more easy and possible because if you have a following of, um, you know, 100,000 people on Instagram, right, and that 10% become your customers because you do neat designs you can uh, do nice um, uh, workmanship on on your jewelry or cut and polish uh, great stones you'll find your customers who are willing to come on board so so the that word wholesale is slightly changed but uh, so you would become a bulk trader yes you could write a two million dollar invoice or a five million dollar invoice or a two hundred thousand dollar invoice but it's changing so it is a great time for anyone who's serious, but there's a lot to learn as well. Yeah. And so for your particular path, did you also do formal gemology training or was everything in a more family style method of transmission? Uh, I did my formal uh, learnings as well, but at the same time, uh, because the the trade uh, required me actually to be hands-on. So what we did in the classroom, sometimes you got to the field and none of it mattered. So that was an interesting uh, perspective of how, how do we manage that? So it's, it's great to learn and it's great. I mean, uh, I, I love to uh, understand and uh, get new knowledge all the time. Uh, and I appreciate my mentors, my teachers. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's something you have to have an open mind so that then, uh, then you can upgrade yourself or uh, reskill yourself every day. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. The thing is, 
the thing is uh, the classic uh, genealogical knowledge is not most of the time suitable for Sri Lanka. Because if you study a geological school like GIA or JMA or AIGS, most of the geological class and most of the basically gemology was developed in consuming countries. So it's all about facet stone. Now, you go to uh, one of these geological class, you learn how to identify the stone. That, okay, this is sapphire, this is pinel, this is garnet, this is that, this is that. You use instruments in order to identify faceted stone. The next day you are in New Gala, it's rough market. You don't see any faceted stone. You don't have any instrument except your torchlight. Thanks to your torchlight, you will be able to check the amount of uh, the quality of the silk. If it's silky, is it milky, something like that? Which uh, type of particle? And you will be able, if you know about heat treatment, but geological schools don't teach about heat treatment. If you know about heat treatment, you will be able to, to figure out if this stone will burn well, or if it will maybe one day, two days, three days, four days of heat treatment. But this is not taught in geological school. Geological school were developed to, uh, as a main market, people who are either hobbyists or people who are working in a jewelry store in consuming country. I don't know any geological class that was specifically uh, done in order to train people who are in a producing country and they get a piece of rough and they are wondering what should I do with that? Yeah. Because this is not the kind of question that is covered in a geological schools. Yeah. So that's why when you see, when you go in Sri Lanka, there are very few people actually in the trade who study gemology because when they start and they open a gemological, uh, a gemology book, they don't feel that there is anything in this book that is useful for them directly the next day when they will see, uh, they go to Madagascar and they see rough stone. They go to Nigeria, they go even in a, around Kataragama or Radnapura, and they see rough stone. It's yeah. not really adapted. I was quite surprised as a cutter in gemology school. I was surprised that we went through the entire program and really didn't see any rough. Um, I guess, yeah, the methodology that you learn there doesn't really work well with rough because you can't use rough on a refractometer without a window. Um, but anyway, we were we, you were mentioning tools and why we're speaking about tools in in the field. Um, Antoinette Matlins had asked, you know, because in the video you, you could see, you know, you guys were, were there with the pin light looking at stuff. What are the other tools that you, either one of you guys find useful when you're actually in a marketplace like that, or generally in Sri Lanka, whether you're in mines or the market? What, what? Is it for me or for Armin, the question? Well, let, I'll ask you about mines. I'll ask Armil about markets because I know you guys have a, maybe a different specialty. So, Vincent. Okay. Well, uh, when, you buy, when you want to buy sapphire, rough sapphire, the best tool is a torchlight because you want to see the type of uh, inclusion. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a rough sapphire, number one, you want to see where is the C-axis in order to uh, figure out where you will put the table and see if you can cut a nice stone or not. When you find the C-axis, since you have the best color down the C-axis, then you see the shape of the rough, and okay, I can cut uh, something like that. And then you want to look at inclusion. If you have fractures, if you have fracture, you will not be able to cut a clean stone. So maybe it will be two stone or three stone. And then you want to see if there are particles, if there are inclusion, if the stone is clean or not. So you need a powerful torchlight in order to, to study the... You, you don't want to see the inclusion. You don't care. The dealers, they don't care about the inclusion. They want to know if the stone is clean. And if it's not clean, which type of inclusion? You have some crystal that people call bubble uh, in the stone. What is the color of the crystal? Are they reflective or not? Is the stone milky or not? This is what they want to know. Basically, they are trained to understand the question, should I... This stone can be cut and polished directly, or will this stone require heat treatment? Mm -hmm. And if it requires heat treatment, which type of heat treatment it will require? Yeah. So if you understand that, then, you know, if your business is to buy stone that need maybe a few hours heat treatment, 
because your father is doing a blowpipe type and you are doing one specific type of heat treatment, so you will buy one specific type of stone, the one that you know. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, you another guy, you know, he's working with a different type of furnace and he's doing a different type of heat treatment, he will buy the stone that he know will react well. Yeah. And all of that is going with two tools, a torch light and then magnifiers. You, you don't use the loop like that because when you use the loop like that, how you do the torch? Yeah. You, you hold the stone in one hand, you have the torch in the second hand, you, you don't have three hands, so you need to have the, on the uh, head uh, magnifier right. yeah. that uh, magnify by 10, and then with the torch on the light, you can, uh, you can check. And then you need also uh, maybe a cup of water or some oil in order to enable the light. Uh, you know, you have a small, uh, maybe a, a small uh, plate that is white and some water inside. So you will put the sapphire in water. And when you put the sapphire in water, you will be able to see the color zoning. So you want to know basically where is the color zoning you, with your torch, you know, when you put the stone in a plate in the water so you can study the, the color zoning. Then with your torch, you find the C-axis and you study the inclusion. So okay. this is what you need. In, actually, if you know about, if you are trained in uh, buying gemstone, to identify a sapphire is not very difficult. There are not so many stones that have the same dichroism. And just with a torch light, you, can, you don't need a dichroscope in the field to identify a sapphire. You look at the shape, you look at the surface, you look at the skin, you look at the dichroism, and it's, uh, you know, uh, blue, uh, blue, violet, and uh, blue, green. Now, not so many stones that have this uh, kind of uh, reaction. Yeah. It's the same with ruby. So with just a torch and a, a brain full of knowledge, you can identify most of So Then you have to wonder the stone is natural, synthetic, heated or not. There are many questions that you have to answer. But uh, actually, most people use uh, just the simple tools. Yeah. And so, Armil, what do you think if you're if you're in the if you're in the cut stone market, whether you're outside or you're in an office, do you also use tools or do you just need sunlight and eyes? Um, yeah. So Vincent was on the dot with uh, the all, all what uh, we would do in the rough market, and even in the cut and polish market, we it's just the eyes, uh, the, uh, the good daylight or torch as well as, the, of course, there we can use the loop. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the amount, uh, the rest is knowledge of trying to understand what it is and uh, those few points. So that's what's important. Okay. And how, how important when you're buying in the Sri Lankan cut market is the cert? Because obviously we know, and I see people in the comments are, are asking a lot about synthetics, but of course heat treatment as well. When, if you're sitting somewhere buying cut stones, you know, do, you, do you need to get everything certed if it's an expensive stone? Or do, you just, do they tell you, or how does it work with that? So you know, because if, if of we, honest. yeah, so because of we, are, we are within the system, and uh, we 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 know who's supplying us. Uh, we uh, will uh, uh, just taking a step back now because people are asking or there's this uh, discussion about uh, supply chain or traceability and these some of these facts. So uh, so we we also know who who it is coming from, where, who who's our supplier. So it's almost uh, like having a KYC done on every supplier but in the street market right you uh, for, for a outsider they would know uh, who is who and what's uh, what's available so then they have to be uh, cautious of what they buy on the market now uh, said that every stone we would purchase uh, on a weekly basis we would have one of our uh, uh, local labs or gemologists go through it uh, and recheck it to make sure everything is in order. Okay, and that's kind of a, that's kind of a normal part of how the trade's going on down there. You 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 don't normally buy 
without a report necessarily. I mean, you get it, you get no. it done just to check afterwards. Uh, yeah, we would buy it without a report uh, once checking the stone, but we would uh, uh, we would have the stones checked before we ship it out to our customers. Uh, and sometimes, if we'll say if it hasn't gone in for the gemologist check, uh, when the cutters are looking at the, I mean, this I'm talking about more on the commercial grade goods, right? Uh, what have been uh, purchased? So if it's lots or uh, 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 you know x amount of stones, so even the cutters when they are looking through the stones to do the repairs or for the because all the gemstones that we buy in the local market we recut and repolish. Mm -hmm. for our international uh, customers so at that point it gets picked up if something's wrong or sometimes if it's dropped and it's touched on the lap you immediately know if it's not a sapphire yeah yeah the cutter picks it up actually uh, the cutter is a very often a very good uh, if you want to know what is a stone if you have somebody who has spent 20 years cutting sapphire and you give him something that is not sapphire he will find out very quickly when he will start to cut the stone yeah I've even met a few cutters who've told me that they can tell the difference between heated and unheated sapphires by the almost the texture of the stone on the lap when polishing. Though so I cannot, I cannot do that yet, but maybe someday. Um, there is there is a different type of heating. You know, you you put a stone like a blowpipe for uh, twenty minutes, and then uh, I'm not very sure that uh, I don't think you know that one. If you make a, a real test with, uh, okay, can you identify? Good. Yeah, we should test them. That would be and fun. Maybe we should close all the lab and just ask the guy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so, Armel, while we're, while we're talking about this, um, Antoinette Matlins had asked, in the markets um, it, regarding treatments, it, are some people sort of, you know, because we're, we're talking about direct experience and and, you know, growing up in the market, uh, environment are some people so knowledgeable and so experienced that they can kind of have an idea that something's treated uh, just from you know just from the first look um, or or does it always kind of go back to the report you know for the final uh, there, there, there's there you you can tell from looking at it on the field uh, pretty much again uh, today because there's different types of technologies being used you unless you really have your uh, finger on the buzzer right uh, you can drop the ball very easily yeah. so it's about uh, knowledge like winston says uh, it's about understanding the different aspects uh, the having somebody like a key person with you uh, like even when when i was in my training uh, at one point when i had to buy x amount per week as a requirement, uh, then I had a, what they call a second eye going with me. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, while I may have been uh, given certain decision-making strength or powers, uh, the the second eye would go through uh, because that person had, we'll say, 20 years of experience of being on ground. So he mm -hmm. might point out, hey, you know what, this is not the right thing or so forth. So. These are some of the areas that okay. So you're kind of uh, you're you're somebody's holding your hand in crossing the initial bridge, so yeah. that the first two three years you get over that, and even at that time you can have failures. Yeah. And so for your particular mm -hmm. educational journey, did you have to spend some time doing cutting as well? Uh, yes. So that that was uh, one of my primary things which I did uh, in uh, learning to cut, uh, as well as uh, actually uh, I I had the opportunity because my I think uh, the ties because of their relationship with my dad from 1962 with the Thai rubies while he was in Hong Kong uh, in 77 when the gilders were found he was uh, they, they they actually showed him how it's done. So uh, when I was, uh, I think, uh, in my teens, when I came home, it was really exciting uh, because my dad would have had started the furnace, which was just uh, next uh, on the next property. Um, and uh, we would just go in and see what's going on. And then 
we had a, a ruby furnace at that time which uh, the whole idea was to ensure that the stone remained intact with inclusions so uh, so then we had a method of uh, taking the temperature up very slowly uh, up to 1100 degrees or 1200 degrees especially in uh, star sapphires so uh, so uh, we were given uh, some duty to uh, move the ampere age uh, controller <laughs> every 30 minutes so this is uh, this was part of you know your 16 17 15 16 17 years old when you were doing that so you kind of saw what uh, what that uh, star ruby turned out to be and so each aspect was a learning so yeah so cool but on that you could not uh, i know with the method that your father was uh, was doing you could not really uh, you know when you see a random ruby you know in the, in the market it's uh, kind of difficult to guess if the stone was heated or not correct correct i mean <laughs> Yes, but at that time, the, we had so much of material available compared to today. Uh, so even even uh, even buying a uh, so when I think in the mid '90s when we started the calibrated part of the business in Sri Lanka, uh, when orders started coming from countries like Japan, so uh, we we had access where uh, we could buy a fairly large quantities of material for small stones whether it was three millimeter, four millimeter goods, uh, but on Vincent's question on the red, so uh, we, we could differentiate, especially on the star rubies, because of the inclusions, that's, that became a unique thing which we were doing because not everybody would heat uh, uh, something that had the inclusion. So this was a s approach that we took uh, that we, we were able to keep the stone intact. So that became a speciality at that time. Mm. Mm. So in the past, uh, people were thinking if the stone is clean, maybe it's heated, but if it has inclusion, it's uh, not heated. That's the way Correct. they were thinking. And, uh, but actually, the stone was heated nevertheless. Yes, yes. You see, Justin, this is one thing that people you, most of the time don't figure out. But heat treatment started to become an issue when in the 1980s or 1990s, people started to pay higher price for stones that were not heated. Before that, nobody care. Yeah. Before that, if a stone stone are heated for more than one thousand years in Sri Lanka, the blowpipe technique done in Sri Lanka is described by uh, Arab traders in the 11th century or 12th century, and the price was the same. When people were going in the market in Sri Lanka in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, nobody was asking about heat treatment or, or if they were saying, oh, maybe we can improve a bit the color. But actually, the value was on the color, not on a question like, is the color heated or unheated? Nobody was asking that question. Yeah. And there was no difference in price. So in that situation, the heating would have been is, good uh, to make the color 70s, better. 80s, 90s, it started. And... Uh, and now people wonder, but I can tell you, you know, if you could identify a stone heated or not in a market condition, there will be no need for labs. Yeah. And I can tell you, when you work in a lab, there are some stones. They are not easy to identify. And you just cannot identify when they are off. Even with a microscope at 20x or 30x, when the stone is nearly without inclusion, and a heat treatment less than 1,200 degrees, good luck to identify. If you say that you can identify that in market condition, just looking at the stone. Now, that's it. There are some people, when they are very, very uh, specialist on one type of goods, for example, they work in a place like Mogok, or they work in Sri Lanka with one type of sapphire coming from one deposit. And... After 10 or 20 years, they get a very good eye about that. And then if there is anything that is a bit different, they will say, mm, for this one, there is something that is a little bit unusual. But most of the time, 
because for for many things that come for experience after looking at many stones for days and days and years and years there is something a little bit unusual but you don't know how to explain uh, it's the color is a little bit different from what i'm used to see this type of stone usually they they are not reacting too much like that but this one so it's different yeah. they they become suspicious Do you but think, because yeah. they spend so many years watching uh, one type of material. But these days it's becoming super difficult because stone and market are more globalized and you see stone for coming from everywhere. Now maybe it's a little bit different, this stone, because it's coming from a new deposit because somebody traveled to a, a, a new place in Tanzania or in uh, Nigeria or in Madagascar and this is not the same material that you were watching day after day. In the past, like 40, 50 years ago, the Sri Lankan were not everywhere around Madagascar, they were not everywhere around Tanzania, around Mozambique, around Nigeria and Cameroon, or in Ethiopia. They were just working with the stone from Ratnapura. The guys were doing Ratnapura Newitigala, Ratnapura Newitigala. So they were very used to one type of material. Now you are in a place like Beruwala. The stones are coming from all around the world. Yeah. Very complicated. Yeah. So experience, even if you have 20 years experience with one type of stone, it can be very challenging. For me, Sri Lanka currently is one of the most difficult places to buy. Even when I go to the mine, because when I go to the mine, I mean, this is something that we have to explain, but they, they have a traditional system at the mine. For example, you have a, um, one mine. You may have different partners at this mine. So the miners are working. You have a team, like a 10, 20 people. And then you have four owners at the mine. In the evening, at the end, when they, you know, if, if they are in a production, if they are washing the, the gravel, when the production is uh, collected, they will not be able to sell you the stone unless the four owners are able to see the stone and they agree on the price. But most of the time, you don't have the four owners present at the same time. So you go to a mine, you see some production, you cannot buy. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the, all the different shareholders able to see and then one is not there, so he has to, the two that are present bring the stone at home. And then the next day or two days later, they come back and they say, okay, we agree on uh, these are the stones that uh, you saw at the mine. And now you are asking, hmm, are these really the same stone? Uh, during the past two days, maybe somebody hit the stone. You never know. So mm -hmm. to buy stone at the mine, you need to find a mine when there is only one owner or where all the owners are present and they are willing to sell you the stone at the mine on the spot without themselves being able to study the stone very well. So it's, it's very challenging, very, yeah. very challenging in Sri Lanka. And I kind of feel our, our mill, this, this kind of directly ties back to what you were saying before. It really comes down to the personal connection, right? Like you really have to, you know, whether you're talking about the owners at the mine or People know, you know, people in the market and vice versa. It seems to me from what you're saying and from what I've seen, it, I mean, like the trade all over the world, it's a very personal experience and it comes down to knowing a lot of different people in the markets and in the mines and, and, and wherever else, right? Definitely. <clears throat> like Vincent was saying, you know, now, uh, like some of the uh, buzzwords like crowdfunding, right uh, so in sri lanka we call it haul karya so uh, where x amount of people own the mine so going back to tradition and uh, how it was done uh, where the culture was a few people so one person owned the land another person was educated enough to go and get a permit or a license to mine the other person had a few other a uh, few people who would come together as part of the labor force, right? Somebody else owned a water pump. So then they would come together. So it was the, the traditional crowdfunding, which we see today, right? So people would come in and then, so like Vincent said, 
uh, all these people had a stake in the stone, right? And it also comes to another one of the buzzwords today of, I uh, will say, fair trade or the uh, proportionate uh, dispersion of uh, the, the value, right? So it's interestingly uh, in Sri Lanka, going back to years of mining, this uh, everyone gets a share of whether it's so uh, in today's context it's it's slightly changed because there could be somebody hey say hey listen i don't have uh, the ability to take a share uh, or i i need a wage a daily wage or a monthly wage but you got to pay me uh, but even then the main uh, mine owners or the site holders will give a percentage of whatever is found so this is a very interesting concept which is practiced in Sri Lanka, so which covers and ensures that when a stone is found and sold, uh, that everyone in that chain uh, can benefit. And that is something that you see uh, wherever you go in the mining cities and towns where you can see the development and growth of the people, uh, uh, whether it's them... Uh, buying themselves a vehicle, a bicycle, to a motorbike, to a car, to uh, building their homes. So this is really interesting to see. And this is something we see in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, especially because of uh, some of the way that the transactions and the business happens. Mm. Actually, in Sri Lanka, the, as uh, you say, the people, people like you, when you want to become a gem merchant, some people will maybe uh, spend uh, years, you know, studying stone, you know, in a lab in front of your microscope and things like that as a single thing. But the traditional way in Sri Lanka is you have to spend several years meeting all the people in the trade. And then you know who is a kind of a liar, who is a straight guy, who is that, who is that. So then when, when you want to start a business in uh, Sri Lanka, a young Sri Lankan, Number one thing you have to do is you have to meet everybody and to know everybody. Then, you know, can you buy from this guy? Can you do a business with that guy? And the whole thing, it's about the reputation of everybody and all the different families. So you know what you can do. And this, you know, take, uh, take years. Most, most of my friends in Sri Lanka, actually, they spend most of their gemological education or their, their, their gem dealer education learning about the people in the community than actually truly learning about the stone. But they have some time often to do both. And, and this is where many uh, young people, the gemology taught to young people, for example, in, uh, in the West is a kind of different because in Sri Lanka, you have to learn about the community. Everybody know each other, and this is part of the gem culture and the gem education in Sri Lanka. Yeah. And so, Armel, for you, um, how long did you know? You you said already you, you your dad dropped you off when you were seventeen, and you didn't really know much at that time. How long did it take you to be ready to really do business? You know, outside of let's say your family's wings. When, when so were you? I, when were you ready? I think. I think. Uh, in in terms of, you you could be out there in six months to a year, uh, but again, it's about how you can have with the external. Like, okay, if you have somebody helping you and holding your hand through to cross that first uh, uh, bridge, so that that's how you. If you can have the right resource. Um, and then how you make those decisions, that's super important because uh, I, I have seen people try too fast uh, to do it and then they would fall uh, flat on their face. So it, it takes time. It's about understanding what you are trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, uh, what, what your resources you have. I think a lot is about the resources you have uh, and then what are the actions that you can take to get get to your final goal of uh, what you want to achieve there. Mm. So, but um, at least minimum two to three years helps you uh, understand uh, what, uh, the, in terms of the actual gemstones, how to cut it, how to manufacture it, 
uh, what are your markets, uh, what, what can you concentrate on, like Winston mentioned as well. There would be some person who would just buy that one quality. They would not differ from that quality because they know, okay, that's their bread and butter. They'll just stick to that. Then there'll be that other person who would say, oh, or five, five friends get together and say, hey, you know what, let's buy that, try and get that stone, which, is, uh, which we think we can make uh, a, a good profit out of. So then that, that method will, can also work. So on that, it becomes like, again, like a crowdfunding where five people, so if they do lose, uh, their loss is split five ways or 10 ways, right? Okay. So that also can happen, but that's not a good thing because that, that you go back to gambling then. Yeah. Justine, there is a one thing that when you asked the question, there was one thing that was a, a little bit funny. You say, at what time are you ready to fly on your own? Well, I don't know any Sri Lankan who is flying on his own. And this is one of the specificity of the thing in Sri Lanka. Basically, it's at what time you are strong enough to contribute to, to the crowd, basically to the team, because Amil is still working with his brother and his father. Yeah. It's not like, uh, okay, now I'm strong enough, I go out from my family, my family doesn't exist anymore. This is not the way the Sri Lankan are working. And this is where they have such a big advantage, because when I go to Madagascar, when I go to Tanzania and see like that, you can see that the Sri Lankan are strong because they work as a family. And, and family extended. They work with the brothers, the sisters, the cousin, the father. And you have many... Um, it's very easy to find a place where you have five people who are buyers, a, a buying office in, a, you know, in Africa, where you have five people. They are all more or less for the same family. And then you have five others in Sri Lanka. And then you have two or three others who are going to Japan and China. And one or two who are going to Europe or the US. So sometimes you have basically a, a company in Sri Lanka. It's about 30 or 35 people. And the question is, the family will look at you. And then they will wonder what you like to do on, in which part of the business we will put. We will put you, will you be uh, the guy going to Africa because you like to spend day in a village on uh, going from village to village to find some rough? Or do you like to cut? Or do you like to hit? Or do you like, or are you more like a salesperson? So you will go to uh, maybe uh, the US or you are a buyer or you will buy, you are better to buy faceted stone and you, you are good at recutting. So the, the, the way I see families in Sri Lanka now, they, it's a whole family business. And you are not working out of your family. You are not doing a business most of the time alone. You are a, a, a piece of the chain. Yeah. And, and it, the family is discussing with you to, fi to find out where you will fit exactly in this uh, whole thing. But Armin is still working with his uh, brother and his cousin. Yeah, no, I, it's a good point. And, it, and it's definitely an interesting um, thing that... that differentiates and this is one of the reasons why a single western guy for example who thinks that he can go to Sri Lanka or Africa and succeed cannot this is what I tried to do when I tried in, uh, in Burma and then I realized that I, I'm a one person who has no understanding about stone no understanding about rough no understanding about heat treatment and in front of me I have a family of 20 or 30 people who know each other they have you know everybody is uh, doing uh, a, a part of the of the business, and they are all very good at what they are doing, and they were trained by people, you know, from their fathers, their uncles, and things like that. And then I realized that okay, this is not uh, what can I do as a single person? You cannot. I, I don't. I don't think you can. The, the Sri Lankan are so strong because they are. 20, 30 people from the same family working together. Yeah. No, it's... it's, it's that's, a, really that's a good hard. point. Uh, that's a good point, Vincent. Yeah, I think uh, there's been times people, friends, uh, I think including maybe yourself has at one point, because of course we have a very large family and uh, uh, where everyone, wherever we have gone, it's been a cousin and now like, how can everyone be a cousin, <laughs> right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a funny situation. <laughs> 
regularly when I'm going, for example, to Berwana and you ask me, uh, and I, 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 on the way back, I tell you uh, about people I met and you say, who is that guy? And then you check, you ask your father, oh, okay, so this guy is a cousin of uh, my, uh, my wife or a cousin of myself, like a three or four. And the funny thing I see every time I go with army in Sri Lanka, the number one thing they do before to look at the stone, they are trying to find out at which level of the cousin they are. Then when they know exactly that, okay, he's my cousin, I'm his cousin. So then immediately they know that they are from the same family somewhere. There is one important thing that many people maybe had, when I was there at the beginning don't really understand. And then I, I found out that it's uh, very good. Then they know they cannot cheat each other. Because... If you find out that you were cheated, now you can tell your father to speak with his brother and things like that, and to discuss with the guy who teaches. So the number one thing about knowing about stone, when you want to buy stone, is to know your supplier. And in Sri Lanka, I can tell you the first thing they do is, I want to know if I'm buying from one of my cousins or if I'm buying from somebody I have no idea who is he. <laughs> and this is highly important, knowing your supplier and knowing your contact. And this is something that in 2005 with Army, I, I really realized on the years later that, okay, they have a strong advantage. I know nobody and they know everybody. Okay, good point. Yeah. So yeah, we... that's a, sorry. Uh, there's an interesting point uh, I think Winston mentioned, trying to find out who can do what and what they are good at and giving, letting them do that as part of the company. And I remember some years ago, uh, Fred Moad gave a presentation at one of the GIA gatherings in Bangkok and how Fred, when Fred had just come back into taking over the business from his dad and uh, how the three brothers, uh, they, 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 they were initially having to take on certain roles and then they decided, okay, we are, we are good at this and we are good at that and then let, let's get management for the rest of it. So that that's uh, that's that was a big takeaway I took uh, took from Fred as well some years ago, uh, which which is really helpful because you don't have to be good at everything, and uh, when it comes to a success of business, you need to figure out what works for the business as well. Mm. No, it's good, and the, it's 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 so interesting to imagine because obviously I'm not from a situation like that. If I can imagine if my whole family was in gemstones and everybody had a specialty and then you could just sort of, you know, based on your interests and stuff and your personality, you could just sort of gravitate into a specific role that would be very helpful to everybody else. So that's cool. Well, for, what was, what, what did you find was your special interest or talent? Did you, did you go into one certain area or did you do a lot of stuff? Uh, I, I think Justin, because uh, 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 I, I was, like I said, not a conventional learner and I love multitasking and doing different things all the time. I do get bored very quickly. Uh, and uh, so when, when I went into the industry, uh, you would start work at 10 and finish at 2, right? <laughs> Other than being in Ratnapura uh, at the marketplace in, in Colombo, uh, you would just start work at 10 in the morning and finish by 2, 3 p.m. So it was like, oh, okay, what do you do with the rest of your time, right? So uh, so I, for me, I wanted to do different things. I, I had um, my entrepreneurial ways. So uh, I went into different businesses and Do we lose him? I mean... It seems that we lost the uh, army. Sorry. For... Oh, he's back. Oh, okay. You're back. Am I here? Yeah. 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 So, so because of my entrepreneurial ways, I was excited by different ideas from hospitality to infrastructure work to other projects after Sri Lanka uh, came out of the conflict in 2009-10. So it's, in, it's been a different 10 years with some exciting things happening uh, in Sri Lanka as well. For me, okay. But I, I mean, this is also something that is very traditional in the gem trade in Sri Lanka, and I, I have seen that also in Myanmar. 
people know that, you know, with gemstone, sometimes the business is going, but sometimes for some reason, the business is stopped. So you, I, I have seen many people in uh, families in the gem trade, especially Sri Lanka and Myanmar, where you have, uh, you know, a deep uh, culture about gemstone. They never have a single, they, they never put everything in the gemstone trade. They most of the time have some farming. They have a farm. They have something that can generate an income regularly, maybe for three, four, four, five years, if there is a war, like Second World War, or the First World War, and all the gem trades stop. They have to survive for four, five, six years. So many, uh, many gem merchants or gem miners that uh, I met are also invest in farming or some uh, other business because sometimes gem business is very quiet. For sure, uh, for sure, Vincent. So, uh, yeah, I, I've, I mean, in the last few years, I've also, because uh, the changing uh, ways of, uh, you know, how people do things, even some of the, a lot of the Thai dealers who, who have had uh, properties on, you know, in the Salem area, they've converted or their kids want to make it into a boutique hotel or something different. So, so there's a lot of things like that happening. So, yeah, you're right. Um, let's go back a little bit. So we, we spoke quite a bit earlier about um, heated stones and treated stones, but there's been several questions about synthetics in the market. So I want to ask you about this, Armel. Um, and I'll kind of just blend a few different questions together, but I guess to start off with, are there synthetics in the market? How do you avoid buying them? And is there a sort of a... a you know, outside of just knowing everybody, is there a sort of a legal way to know, you know, who is a sort of the bad guy or whatever, the, the synthetic selling guy? How do you deal with this in, in a community like that? I think when we are in a marketplace, whether it's uh, on eBay or any platform, whether you're on uh, uh, IT virtual platform like eBay or in a marketplace in Ratnapura or... Uh, in Chandraburi or in Africa, right? Uh, the chances of having some people uh, trying to give you something that you don't want, or uh, maybe they're just testing your knowledge. They want to know whether you know gemology. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so they are going to try it, right? So, and the closer you get to the mines, right? There are enough of uh, because you, uh, people who come looking for. Uh, gemstones uh, who who want to get into the industry if they c approach it the wrong way and I remember uh, one of the uh, on uh, uh, Vincent's one of the first uh, webinars that Vincent did uh, where he was explaining about this about the knowledge aspect what what and what you need to safeguard so uh, if you have all that in place and you have step one to ten uh, then you still need somebody on ground uh, who can support you, look after you, uh, maybe even like a protector. So, so this aspect for our trade, initially until you, you know what you're doing. I mean, even tomorrow, if I go into some marketplace, I can be um, under pressure uh, because we'll say I, I come with some amount of cash and I, I'm in a mood to buy, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm in a mood to buy uh, and I want to buy, and by, we'll say the market opens at 10 o'clock in the morning, closes at four, at three o'clock, if I don't have enough, I have just picked up one stone and I need to buy 10, right? What do I do? I try to rush. I, I, so that's when I make the mistake. Mm. And uh, this is going back to my uh, uh, Ratnapura days where I had one of our friends, uh, Prida, who was the first uh, person who took me to Thailand? Um, and he and I, he, he had allowed me to come and sit with him. And he, uh, we started, uh, we'll say about nine o'clock in the morning, and 12 o'clock we break for lunch. And then he turns around and says, Oh, so Amila, how many stones did you buy? So I turned around to him and said, Hey, you know what? I bought six stones. And I asked him, So how many did you buy? He said, One stone. And he said, Okay, let me see your stones. And all six of my stones had inclusions in it, right? And wouldn't have turned out too well. 
and the stone he had bought uh, didn't have that. So that that was his, you know, 10 years of experience or his business approach that he was able to do that. But for me, I was just a few months into it. Of course, the six stones I had bought were, you know, of not much value, but still uh, the result I would have got after uh, cutting and polishing them would have been with inclusion. And then, have but have you actually been burned on synthetics before? Have you accidentally bought something that you thought was a natural stone? Uh, because of the process we work on, um, and uh, because it's we are protected because the payment doesn't happen on the street, right? Mm -hmm. So, or, or we wouldn't. So, at the same time, uh, when Vincent was there in two thousand and five. Uh, we were in Ratnapura and uh, we, were, uh, we were with the Australians and Grant said, when we got to the marketplace, Grant says, stop the bus, let them out. So we were like very concerned. My dad was very concerned and he said like, hey, you know what? There's so much of synthetic in the market, right? So uh, uh, Grant turned around and said, well, they're all gemologists. Right. So let the, but we, 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 we <laughs> obviously warn them, you know, they, so even that, so we, uh, even when we have friends or we have our immersion program or the boot camp for gemstones, uh, what we do is we, we get people to spend a little money, right. And if they want even, you know, a hundred dollars so that they can, uh, it's, it's also becomes a learning for them. Mm -hmm. And I, I know but, that the first time that I had gone there was with a group. And for us, that you know, it was a it was a group from gemology school in Bangkok, and that was probably really, the, I mean, among many many highlights, buying the stones in the market was really something that was really exciting because it was sort of scary, but it was exciting, and there was a you know element of risk, and a couple people did you know make some mistakes because they didn't follow the rules that our guide gave to us, but even then, it was a low cost. Um, lesson you know it was a good lesson for the whole group because we saw okay they bought synthetics they look like natural rough you know and you had that pressure as you as you were saying you're surrounded by people who are putting stuff into your face uh yeah, it's exciting it's a roller coaster of emotions really and lots of and, ways to make mistakes though and a bigger mistake <laughs> you can always make on the street is uh returning the stone to the wrong person because you've got 30 people or 20 people mobbing you right around and you're taking one stone and then you're just returning it back because you somebody has just put another stone in your hand. So yeah. by that time you have given the stone to somebody else, it may be all uh, uh, to make to take some money out of you, but it may be a plan to two people who are out there uh, to get something out of you. But so that can happen very easily and that's yeah. you've got to be super cautious of just holding the stone back and says, who, who does this belong to? And then you return it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, it can become chaos very quickly. Yeah. Usually when, if I go uh, to a, a gem market, like, a, uh, you know, in, a, in a Sri Lanka, as a foreigner, everybody know you are a foreigner. Uh, number one, most of the crook who are around will come to see you because, you know, they will try. And then uh, you may have a few people who will show you, uh, uh, I will say, natural stone. But uh, most of the time when you go to a gem market, if people don't really uh, know uh, who you are and what you are doing, it's very complicated to see any stones that are actually good. Because the reason, if... The reason for this stone to be there is probably because professional buyers didn't want it to buy the stone. So in the street, in many uh, gem market like uh, uh, Ratnapura or even in Burma or Sinadad, uh, most of the stone that you have in the in the market are actually the leftovers. And so it's a very interesting place to uh, to study because if somebody brings you a stone like that, the first question you should ask is why this stone is coming to me. Why, why this guy brings a stone to me? So you look at a stone and uh, you should think about that. 
instead of thinking, oh, you know, maybe I will buy and become millionaire. No, I don't think this is exactly the, especially the stone is big and clean. There is probably something funny. Yeah. Too good to be true. And, and speaking of too good to be true, um, Alexander Bugish had asked a little while ago, because we were speaking about heated, uh, he was asking, are there good unheated sapphires on the market now, or is everything, you know, are you... Sure, there are. Yeah. There are. But in the market, it depends where. Yeah. You have a good uh, uh, rough uh, sapphire ruby in the market, sure. But uh, probably not... Uh, if uh, you go out uh, like uh, we were doing with our meal, uh, with uh, this group of 120 uh, uh, people yeah. going out from the bus in the street in Ratnapura, the street will maybe not be the first place where you will see the stone. If somebody has a stone like that, he will not start to go around in the street and show the stone to everybody. He will think and he will say, okay, who is uh, the richest guy I know who is in the stone? And then they will bring the stone to this person. Yeah. That's why when you go to Africa, to Madagascar and Tanzania, you see all the Sri Lankans, they are competing, building big houses with, it looks like a little bit Las Vegas, you know, when you go to Ilakak, you have this uh, street with, uh, you know, uh, the place where the Sri Lankans are, are buying called uh, Sakavir, where you have house after house with a signal and a lot of light in the evening in order to uh, show to the miners or to the brokers that uh, here this is the house of Big Boss. And uh, people will not uh, come uh, in the street uh, holding the stone like that and for everybody to see. They will hide the stone in their pocket because they don't want to get stolen. And they will go uh, to see the guy they believe will uh, give them the best price. Yeah. So if you don't look like a guy who can give a very good price, Probably you will not see these stones. Yeah. yeah. And so, Armil, we wanted to ask this question already, but I feel like so many people have asked it in so many ways as well. But what for people that want to come to Sri Lanka and buy stones, and maybe they don't know anybody, what what's the advice you can give them? You know, how how can people come safely? How can they export? You know, legally and and do things the right way. What what do you recommend? So uh, we, we obviously have the ecosystem for that. Uh, everything is um, easy and above board for you to do. Uh, the only thing is uh, uh, to have somebody good, uh, trustworthy, and somebody who uh, knows uh, the backyard, who they can uh, work with, uh, so that uh, they can ensure the whole uh, process or the trip they come for they get the best out of it okay. so uh, so that's what's important uh, mm -hmm. so to have it planned uh, you know uh, work out your resources understand uh, the moving parts right and then why are you coming uh, what do you want to achieve what's your purpose of your trip mm -hmm. and then have the resources lined up have 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 trustworthy people to support you help you uh, because it's it's like Vincent also mentioned, it's not a lone journey, right? So it's about having the right uh, 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 things in place. And then if that's the case, you, you can do X amount of trips, your first few trips. And then obviously, like anywhere in the world, you'll get used to, you'll get comfortable. Uh, so at that point, if, if you feel that you can, you want to be a lone ranger, you can try that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so so you you take baby steps initially. Try to understand your requirements, how you want to do it. And uh, in terms of export, we have a very uh, easy system where uh, we'll say, for example, uh, the person you are working with uh, is a licensed exporter and gem dealer. They can do the export uh, for you on behalf of you. So it makes it very easy. And so those are some of the uh, aspects that they would okay. want to work on. And then what about exporting rough? Is this a different situation or is it, is it the same as everything else? So, ex <laughs> sorry, Vincent, go ahead. No, I say you cannot. In Sri Lanka, you're not, you're, exporting rough is illegal. So, yeah, so, so 
So, yeah, so you can't we... export rough gemstones out of Sri Lanka. It has to be completely finished. Uh, um, and only, only uh, rough gemstones that are going for uh, gem research to a lab or similar that we have to get special exemption from the National Gem and Jewelry Authority that also uh, has to be like uh, small quantities and very specific requirements. So mm -hmm. that, that can be done. Uh, the only uh, treaty that we have is with Thailand, which was signed many years ago, which is a very interesting treaty. And uh, that's the benefit or the working relationship with Thailand, where when at that time in the, I think 77 or 78, we signed a treaty where Gouda is, uh, we are able to export Gouda, rough gemstones to Thailand, right? Now here, what happens is because of the manufacturing and the purchasing of the dealers in Sri Lanka, uh, of all material that cut, over one carat, right? So only the smaller goods are left over, which is significant uh, because Thailand uh, has a large cutting industry. Well, at least it, it has a, a big setup, right? Uh, the numbers have reduced in the last uh, maybe 10, 15 years in terms of cutters, but said that the industry is still available so uh, that then those goods get exported to Thailand and those get processed and uh, then, um, you know, it comes into the uh, trade. Okay. So, and the, the idea behind the, you know, this, this prohibition of exporting rough is basically just to keep more of the trade inside of Sri Lanka, right? You know, to give, is that the, that, is that the point? To give the cutters more work and... Uh, well, th that could be one point of it, but because we, we've actually, with so many years of experience of bringing the stone into a finished product, uh, in, in whichever way to get the best color in a stone, the orientation, the sizing, uh, so bringing all those uh, uh, angles into, uh, into, into the business, and to finish it. So even uh, now the jewelry manufacturing, although Sri Lanka is not a large jewelry manufacturing hub yet, uh, in terms of the uh, final finishing of the gemstone from cutting, heating, and that full process, so we can uh, give, give the best product to the international market already as a value added product. Yeah, that's cool. So speaking about that still, we had a question from the audience that were from uh, Wade DeLassis. He was asking, what is your opinion about, you know, this, this idea of this independent gem hunter type person that will come and, you know, kind of what you were saying earlier, kind of try to circumnavigate the, the normal chain, go directly to the mine, try to, you know, if they can try to get something directly from the mine and then, and then take it out of the country. Is this, I, I guess just wanting to know what's your opinion about this. Is this a, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this messing up this established system or is it work? So, yeah. So uh, advice which I can give even for a very large uh, player or a company or even an individual who wants to get into that, into the trade or try to be part of it, right? So uh, uh, again, it, it, it falls into having somebody uh, on ground who can support you. Then even if you buy the rough stone yourself, I mean, using, uh, using somebody you trust or who you can work with on ground, you can have the gemstones cut in Sri Lanka because you've got the best cutters. You've got the uh, best uh, you know, people who will do the preform. See, when you say cutting a stone, you don't throw it into one side of a machine and it doesn't come out from the other side, right? Yeah. right? You, have the, you have the initial pre-shaping, right? From the rough to pre-shape or, or orienting the stone, then to pre-form it, then to cut it. And if you feel that it's going the wrong way or the color mixture is not right. So you have all that expertise already in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So who would, I mean, why would you want to take it out and try to be funny? You don't need to do that, right? 
And so, I, and I, yeah. I kind of want to emphasize that point a little bit because when I went to Sri Lanka and, and I, you know, when I met you and I was working on this article of the history of cutting in Sri Lanka, one of the things that really stood out to me that I haven't even today seen anywhere else in the world was the way that the sort of, that the preformer isn't just part of the cutting, it's sort of a role, like as the heater. You know, someone, I've met a lot of people now in Sri Lanka whose only job is to take the rough, preform it, and then they they just give it to somebody else. That's, they don't think about cutting, they don't think about polishing, but they're, you know, become master preformers. And I know even here in, in Bangkok, sometimes I'll see stones come through that are already preformed, and, and they're amazing. I mean, they look like a finished stone, but, you know, obviously they're rounded and rough, but they the proportions are correct, the depth is correct, there's no window, they, you know, they really understood how to get the perfect yield and, of course, the color. And I haven't really seen it, you know, even in, with all the cutting in Thailand, the, the Thai cutters don't specialize so much in that way. There, there's not somebody who has a, a you know, a, an office somewhere where they just sit and preform all day and then that's their job. They're just more part of a bigger chain. And I, I just thought that was so cool they had so much pride, you know, the preformers that I spoke to had so much pride in their special skill, which was really about orienting rough for color and yield. And I just, yeah, I, it's so unusual. I thought we should, we have to make a special note of that for, for the Sri Lankan cutting industry. It's, it's, it's cool. Thank you, Justin. Uh, actually, that, that also developed so much because you will have the owner of the stone who has put millions or hundreds of thousands uh, into a stone, right? And then they are able to, they sit next to that preformer, the pre-shaper for uh, hours and hours because they own the stone, right? So, so then there's always a conversation between the preformer and the owner. So yeah. there's always a learning on both sides of what it's going to turn out uh, or do you want to keep it over 10 carats because you know there's an added value there, it's a magic number. So there are all these different aspects that play in as well. Yeah, uh, and I've, I I really like it because it's, as a cutter, I really respect the sort of more intimate relationship that I feel like they, you know, between the, the cutter, the preformer and the stone, and also like you said, but be, between the preformer and the owner, you know, I haven't really met, I mean, I know that there are other people that do that, you know, the, the owner will come and sit with the cutter. I think there's, I've heard stories of Burmese people doing the same thing, but, I heard that a lot in Sri Lanka of, you know, even because uh, my, my co-teacher in, in Bangkok is a Sri Lankan cutter. And he's told me stories of, you know, when you have a really high end stone, you take the machine to the owner's house and you sit there in the living room and you, you, you do the whole stone with them. And it's a very intimate experience that is not really like any other, you know, you won't find that in London or Paris, someone going into someone's house with their faceting machine. So this is kind of cool. It's, it's unique. Okay. Yeah, actually, this is, uh, you see, when, uh, well, when you look at the history of uh, Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan industry, the cutting, as uh, we know, came quite on the late because the cutting was developed in Europe during the Middle Ages. You know that, Justin. Yeah. So this, you know, the cutting is something a little bit new in Sri Lanka when you look at the whole history about uh, trading. So um, when they put the law about, uh, you know, uh, cutting that you cannot export raw from Sri Lanka, it's in order to, to build uh, and to support the cutting industry. Yeah. But actually, very few uh, Western, uh, you know, uh, the final buyer really wanted to, uh, to provide all their secret to the people at the source. Because you imagine if you are a cutter like you, and you are making your own, uh, your main business by cutting stone, do you want your supplier to start to become your competitor? No. Yeah. So basically, the way it happened in Sri Lanka is that actually uh, Sri Lanka, in order to follow the regulation, you get your stone cut in Sri Lanka, but actually most of this cutting for people in the industry, it's mainly preforming. So you have some people who have good skills, and they are mainly preforming the stone, and all the stone are, are cut. Of course, they are polished, but then, you know, when the stone go to Thailand or go to Europe, then they are recut, yeah. basically repolished. 
And this is what is ongoing. So like that, you can follow the regulation. There is a, a part of the job that is done in, uh, in Sri Lanka, the performing, because people know very well sapphires, they know how to do. But then, you know, the final step of the cutting and the polishing is done still, you know, at the office of the gem merchant in Paris or in Bangkok or somewhere like that, where they have, you know, some uh, very good technique about uh, giving the best uh, uh, polish in order to have more light entering the stone and doing all the small, uh, the small little step. So yeah. you can, you can uh, do business regularly like that. You buy... Uh, uh, facet stone that actually preform stone in Sri Lanka, you export them legally and then you go there. You can also have fun buying uh, rough stone. Now, of course, for example, me, every time I go to Sri Lanka, I was able to export my stone that are basically rough because I don't buy facet stone at the thing, but, you know, I write a letter in order to uh, to the National Gem and Jury uh, Authority in Sri Lanka explaining what I want to do and I ask you know, for an exemption. So everybody can try that. But then this is at the discretion, you know, of the uh, people from the National Gem and Jury Authority on the custom to see, they see the stone, they see the amount. And if they consider that they, they, are, they want to be nice with you and allow you to, uh, to live with samples, that's okay. But actually, if they see that you are coming every week and every week you have samples and samples and samples, you don't give talks, you don't write paper and things like that, after a point, they will see you and you will be bad. Yeah. So you can... Uh, some people told me, oh, I was able to export some, uh, some rough. Yeah, maybe you did that once. But uh, cheating, uh, yeah. sometimes yeah. it doesn't work very well long, on the long run. So can you, can you make a business point on that? Most of the professionals in the industry are, you know, uh, uh, they set up an office in Sri Lanka with uh, some people they know uh, well for, for years, maybe because family relation or because they became friends. And, and they follow the process. And everybody, basically everybody get his share of the cake. Yeah. And this is the way I think uh, the business is, uh, is uh, ongoing for generation where everybody, you know, do a part of the work. Like if everybody was from the same family and you want every person at every step of the industry to be able to make a living doing what they are best, what they do best. Yeah. So, and this is the way you have a healthy industry when yeah. everybody get his share and everybody is bringing, adding some value to the, to the chain. No, it's a good point. So Armil, while we're talking about cutting, um, we had a question from Alexander Bugish. He was asking, you know, thinking about the, the style or the approach of cutting from the Sri Lankan point of view, he was asking, why do so many cutters there are still focused on weight instead of, you know, kind of working towards this international standard of, you know, what you were saying, how you recut many stones. Is this still the, you know, let, let's back up maybe and say, is this still the trend or, or the habit? And if so, what, why? So what's interesting on the single stone marketplace today is that it's not necessarily that the old consuming market, how they wanted the facets, uh, uh, or how they wanted it. So you see a lot of people doing special cuts today, right, Justin? Yeah. So yeah. everyone doing something funny, something nice, something to bring the brilliance out. Uh, so if if you have a customer sitting in Paris and says, you know what, I want a really longish uh, stone, a sapphire, 10 carat, right? I want the stone to be... so, they, or, or they're not interested really about the sapphire, or how long it is, or how wide it is, but they are interested in the designer who's designing it, right? Yeah. So that, I think even like uh, somebody like Chris Hood uh, is doing a great job in bringing certain uh, things uh, in from the design aspect. So like that, there are designers around the world today, and there are young and old designers who, who would bring uh, make a piece, and it's not necessarily made for the cut that, we as cutters and people in the gem industry say, hey, this is the right one. So, so that's very interesting because 
uh, and and I've uh, come across this quite often where a friend wants a one carat diamond, right, or a two carat diamond, and sometimes I tell them, hey, listen, why don't you just go under that, right? Unless you are very specific about it, and you know you don't need to pay that full price. And mm-hmm. most of the time, people want to just uh, they don't they don't mind that. Right, yeah. they would take the 190 or uh, a 90 pointer. So this is very interesting. So similarly, if you want a five carat that looks good on you and you're just buying it for yourself, um, and uh, if it works nice nicely in your design or it works for your designer, so then it might be okay uh, to have that cut that way. And um, just going back. If, if the stone is at, we'll say, 5.15, right? And you want to just repolish it, keep it over 5, it's fine. But at 480, if you're going to drop a shade of color in blue, right? Mm. Or yellow or whatever, pink, right? Uh, of a sapphire, of a 5 carat sapphire, right? This is not made in the lab. Uh, on, uh, so if, if you're going to lose that one, uh, one notch of color or two notches of color, just because that you hit the culette in the wrong place, right? Trying to get the best cut. So mm-hmm. that's where, it, uh, you know, so I, I believe in today's context, uh, if unless the customer or the buyer specifically says, I want this, this, and this, and like going back even to Japan uh, manufacturing, where they said we've insisted on a six by, uh, a seven by five or an eight by six or a nine by seven at that point. Because why it was the casting, right? But today you go to a designer, they'll move the casting around, yeah. right? So while there's a requirement of that specific uh, sizes uh, or, or those uh, percentages to work, so it's not necessarily that that has to be the bar today. Yeah. So it, it can, you can have three different varieties or three different levels of uh, having the bar in such a way that the, uh, I mean, even if you look at a lot of the European uh, antique jewelry, right? It's not necessarily that it's cut in the ways that uh, uh, people would say, okay, this is where the culet should be, and this is how it should be. These are the uh, how many facets should be in that stone. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, for me as a cutter, I really appreciate that everyone in the world is not doing the best cutting because otherwise I wouldn't really have much good work to do. You know, I, I appreciate to get a bulky stone from Sri Lanka or Burma or wherever it's come because we can add our own value and then the jeweler can add their value. So it kind of works in, in my opinion, it works okay as is. That, but that's the point of Justin because the people who are going to Sri Lanka, most of them are buying stones that they can recut. Yeah. You know, professional dealers. So if uh, some stone are, are cut, you know, nicely cut at, uh, let's say, 5.02 carat, there is no space for recutting. Mm-hmm. And if your customer asks, uh, you know, the specifics of your customer is a stone over 5 carat, but that need uh, maybe, you know, a dimension like that, you cannot recut it to fit to the requirement of your specific customer. So this is why, you know, uh, some people told me when a... Uh, uh, I was going there and I, it's the stone are what we call native cut. You know, basically they are preform. And a stone that is basically a preform that was cut, you know, to basically maximize the weight, you can recut it. And maybe you have three buyers who come and they have three different ideas or three different projects, but this stone can fit to three different projects. So this stone would be easier to find a customer that if you know you cut it a little bit better, better is a little bit subjective, that will fit basically your idea. Maybe you will have only one potential customer because this stone will not be okay for the two other potential customers. So then this stone will become more difficult to sell. Yeah. Because the next guy will see that I cannot, do, I cannot make any profit with this stone. And the stone is too beautiful, so it's too expensive and things like that. There is no business for me on this stone. And as these are professionals going there, they look at the stone and say, where can I make some money? You know, and they look at the stone, I can make some money, I cannot make some money. So reject, reject. Maybe the stone is beautiful, but too expensive. there is nothing for him. Yeah. 
I think also we we must say, you know, and this was kind of the whole point of my research article, like in the olden days, and when I talk to the cutters, you know, the old cutters in London who will talk about how they recut a lot of Sri Lankan stones in the 70s and 80s and stuff, you know, in the 80s, everything about the Sri Lankan cutting industry changed, right? Uh, the old native cut that Sri Lanka used to make, which which actually was a quite terrible crude cut is is doesn't even exist anymore like i to me in my personal opinion i think sri lankans now are some of the best cutters commercially in the world you know i mean they have better machines than most everybody else does commercially speaking um and most of the stones there now are you know if they're not perfect for maybe international standards but they're quite good compared to the stones of the 60s and 70s and and you know hundreds of years ago uh but still, yeah, of course, every, every culture, whether it's Japan or France or England or America, has a different specific way that they want to have the finished product look. And so, yeah, I think Vincent and Armil, what you guys are saying is totally right. It gives more flexibility to the to the middle person and, you know, getting towards the final product. Um, you know, it can go in a couple different ways from where the Sri Lankans leave it. And I think that's good for everybody because the Sri Lankan cutters are making their money, too. And you see, one time, several times when I was there, I was wondering why the stone was cut like that. And the owner told me, well, you see, the rough was a bit like that. So, you know, you cut uh, according to the rough you have. There were some parts that were very included that he removed, but he didn't want it to remove all the inclusion because if not, uh, at the end, there would be uh, maybe nothing. And he said, well, you know, I cut the stone like that in order to... Uh, maximize basically what I can get out of the stone on maximizing the chance that I will be able to sell the stone. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you think about it, it's, uh, it's, it's all depending of the, about the, the professional who are going, uh, I think, uh, every week or every once a month or maybe uh, uh, two or three times per year in Beruala who are, you know, or, or, or to uh, Colombo. And they want to, to buy stone basically for their factories that they will be able to recut. One of the interesting things in Sri Lanka, the difference between Sri Lanka I think, and on Thailand, is that in Thailand you have jewelry factories. You have factories where people really need, you know, they have a specific order from a brand in, a, I don't know, in Japan, in a Europe, in the US or in China, and, and they have the specifics of the stones that they have to set in jewelry. You don't have this uh, jewelry factories in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So the people in Bangkok from the factory, they need the stone to be 5.02 by 8.80, and, and, and they need that and that and that. So they are searching specific stone for their design, and they need 200 of them. Everything needs to be recut, yeah. because for this collection, they need these specific stones. Yeah. So you have people who are going to the market searching for stones that will fit this requirement for this collection. Yeah, and I, I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't really think about because you just think about buying single stones. But if you work for a brand, you're not buying, you're buying hundreds of stones that have to go in some kind of matched or, or, or you know, calibrated set. Um, Armel, someone had just asked why we're talking about cutting about precision cutting and you know is there an idea right now in the in the cutting industry of Sri Lanka about precision cutting or has this idea not really made it over there yet um, <clears throat> we've, we've actually been having precision cutting for a while now yeah. and like I mentioned we had uh, I think early 90s we started uh, getting orders coming in from different parts of the world so the precision cutting is happening um, and uh, even for uh, Swiss uh, watches, for the bezels and things yeah. like that, there is stones uh, cut uh, in Sri Lanka, but the concentration of uh, most people is the above, I uh, will say, one carat uh, sapphires or, or gemstones. So because of that, the industry hasn't uh, put too much work into the precision cutting okay. uh, to the scale of what may be available in Thailand. Yeah. And I know from the cut, the cutters that I personally know and work with, you know, I guess maybe they're the ones who got out of Sri Lanka and are working a lot in, you know, in other places, but 
I've right. met some really, really amazing, what I would call precision cutters using hand pieces, you, you know, using the Sri Lankan hand pieces yeah. um, and even doing really, really creative designs, you know, like American style, strange, you know, new designs. But, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of cutters in Sri Lanka, so it's not really, same as Thailand, it's not really fair to put them into one group because there's, you know, there's great cutters and there's good cutters and there's mediocre cutters too, just like anywhere. Yes. Um, okay, so let's let's switch it up a little bit because we spoke a lot about that. And I want to, some people have asked, and we, we already wanted to talk about this as well, um, about training. And I know you, you recently started a new program about training people. And, you know, if people want to come to Sri Lanka and understand all of the things that we've been speaking about from the mine to the heat to the cutting to you know the exporting and the jewelry and and you guys are doing this a little bit now with people coming in right you guys have a new sort of a school that's open. yeah so uh, so we have uh, something called gym art academy at the source and uh, this uh, actually stemmed uh, from uh, uh, you know us being on ground helping uh, Grant and the Australians uh, in 2005 and even before friends coming over uh, and then between that time. Of course, uh, 2005 uh, and uh, up to 2010, inviting people to Sri Lanka, we were a little concerned even when some people wanted to come uh, because we had the conflict on, we had issues with security. From time to time, we had got kind of got used to it because we lived there. Uh, but uh, that was a concern. But beyond 2010, it was a matter of people are able to come. Hospitality industry is growing. And uh, so uh, we, ha we have the Adams Peak, where, which is also a tourist destination. A lot of people tend to go. It's, it's only just 40 minutes from Ratnapura. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we also... How did we lose him? Had uh, we, we had, I think, 2012 or two. Hello. So we we, we had uh, uh, the GIA alumni from uh, different countries in Asia. So we did a, a group. So uh, with that, uh, we and also some discussions with Vincent, maybe going back eight nine years ago. Uh, about you know, uh, there's nobody uh, in a source country uh, or, or the idea of learning what uh, the different aspects from a source country about the gemstones uh, other than from a consuming perspe perspective. So, uh, uh, so then thought, okay, and then we, we, uh, with that, we started doing, uh, uh, working with a few institutions and schools, uh, JDMIS in Singapore, and then Goblin and a few others, the GIA alumni. And so it was interesting to do a complete immersion program uh, where they, people would, uh, and then out of China, we had, we actually did our first uh, all Chinese program uh, some months ago. Uh, and so f even from the Middle East, there has been a lot of interest. So we've been doing that now for about almost uh, four and a half years. So uh, where uh, we, we work with institutions and schools uh, who can bring in their alumni, their students, um, and uh, go through that complete immersion program of understanding the um, different aspects of trade. And uh, so basically gemology, field gemology, uh, the trading aspect. And also when you are there, you also uh, start uh, learning uh, entrepreneurship. So these are the few aspects that we are covering in the boot, boot camp uh, type of program. And at the same time, able to see uh, the country. Uh, we have, uh, you know, other than beyond Ratnapura, we have Elahara. Uh, Elahara is where, you know, sometimes we find the 100 carat sapphires uh, and also sometimes they turn out to be Kashmir. Uh, from the lab so uh, so uh, so there's a lot to see in Sri Lanka and so we have Nivitigala, uh, Palmadulla, Balangoda, uh, Ratnapura and then 
so the whole different areas for people to come and enjoy see learn uh, in sri lanka so that's what we put together through uh, our okay. program and is this only for groups or can individual people come and do it you know like uh, once they finish their gemology school or, or just if any time they want to the the whole idea justin is to mainly share uh, share our knowledge our experience uh, and and sri lanka with everyone so what uh, what we've done is uh, until last year we had pretty much working with only institutions uh, but uh, since january of this year we've opened it out in such a way that we can have people coming in on a at a particular time or period and so they could come in as a group or individually and go go ahead with the program and the immersion cool sounds awesome it sounds you know exactly the right thing for a place like sri lanka where you can really see all aspects of the trade almost maybe in the same city or you know in the same region at least so it sounds you know i, I really want to come and do it I, i've seen you guys as social media since last year and i've always been curious about what it was all about so yeah and several people on the on the group had asked as well um so why we're speaking about that um a few, several people had asked and i think it's maybe the right time to speak about it uh how has it been since since february since covid you know how is the trade now are you guys feeling you know um a lot of you know uh obviously slowness but is it a serious situation for, for in sri lanka right now uh so we we went to went into a complete lockdown on march 20th uh we have a new president uh, since november uh, who's uh, uh really put his team out to work and been able to contain the situation for us uh, which we are really happy and thankful for all the healthcare workers and everyone out there who has made it uh, possible for us to be actually at work uh uh today um so we we, we are out of lockdown uh in terms of uh, because it was march end uh, winston knows very well because uh we we have very similar to the thai new year we have the sri lanka new year where we have almost three weeks of holiday so all the mines shut everything mm-hmm. is closed so that was april so the, because of that we had some space there because it didn't affect us Uh, too much uh, said that beyond that it if, because of the lockdown went on till uh, we'll say uh, mid june uh, we we had everything come to a grinding halt uh, we had some of our uh, cutting factories uh, using social distancing standards and health regulations uh, starting up uh, the operation slowly on the cutting processes uh, so that's going on um jewelry manufacturing lines are back open since last four weeks um mining is slowly getting back to normal uh in terms of the markets markets are slow because we haven't been able to ship goods out yeah so that's 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 and uh, because the consuming markets like europe and the us has uh, been taking a beating on uh the corona situation so there's uh some issues with regards to the uh, regular business that would happen then the regular buyers who would come in specially uh in the last four months our shows in march in hong kong affected so those few yeah. things areas are affected okay and john bradshaw asks any idea when the borders are going to open up for travel again for all of us that are missing our regular sri lankan uh um uh, adventures we we were supposed to open on 1st of august so that's 20 days from now uh but i think we are pushing back uh maybe by a few weeks for the simple reason uh it's not about who's uh, because we haven't had any uh, community infections uh for x amount of weeks uh the issue is how do we let people in and the process because of the um, some people are not showing any symptoms no temperatures nothing so we have to be conscious about how to 
sustained. So that's I think even Thailand and uh, Thailand is lo- doing great. I think on on uh, managing things as well. So uh, just that how do we open it out and what is the protocols we can put the PCR testing where they can be done before somebody gets on a flight and then on arrival. So on this side, what they do, what they're doing right now is. Uh, Sri Lankans who are coming back, we just had a, um, a flight back from uh, Africa, which brought in mostly gem traders. So every one of them went into quarantine except the gemstones. The gemstones went into the cutting factories for cutting. <laughs> so it will hit the market soon. Um, but like, for example, these these people will not go be able to go back to Africa in the short term. So there will be shortage of goods uh, mm-hmm. also as much as we are uh, having maybe the the demand side dropping, there may be also supply dropping supply in different aspects, right? Okay. So uh, so that's where on the border control. Cool. Uh, I heard that uh, you had a visa flight from Madagascar that came and everybody was in quarantine until Monday. So on Monday, everybody was uh, trying to rush to all these guys who were coming uh, full of stone. This is what I heard from Sri Lanka. <laughs> So all, all the passengers were quarantined for 14. They have to go for 14 days quarantine uh, under the regulations and they can stay at a nice hotel. Uh, and uh, at the same time, then after they finish the 14 days, they have to do another 14 days self-quarantine at home. Mm. Okay, but this is a responsible way to, to do it. I think Thailand's kind of in the, almost maybe in the same uh, phase as you guys in terms of opening slowly trying to figure out how to do it safely um, and what's going to be the rules um okay well let there's just a few more questions that people had 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 um asked so if you don't mind i'll, I'll just go through them there i think most of them yeah. are quite short um antoinette matlins had asked do you work also with natural sri lankan spinels because she said she loves them yes we do yeah so do you, is this, uh, compared to the sapphire trade that we hear about a lot, is the spinel trade, uh, is it big or is it a, just a side thing? No, we have 60 varieties of colored stones, 60 plus varieties of colored stones, Justin. So, uh, I mean, because China has become a giant buyer in the world market. And uh, so there is a movement of all material, uh, out, whatever comes out of Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, spinels are also, well, I mean, you, you do get some uh, nice spinels coming out of Sri Lanka from time to time. Mm-hmm. So uh, the market, uh, I mean, the supply is there. And, and of course, uh, you know, because we do process and manufacture a lot of goods that come from Africa, from the uh, people who go out there. So there is a lot of material in Sri Lanka. Okay. And th- this was a, I thought quite an interesting question. I, I have no idea how you're going to respond to it, but Kenan Young asked, do, do gemstones play a role in religion in Sri Lanka? So it's uh, super interesting because all the yellow sapphires uh, from Sri Lanka, generally in, in, the, uh, in India, a lot of the uh, people there, uh, they, they use yellow sapphire uh, for uh, astrological and other purposes. And there's a very high demand. So most of the yellow sapphire demand like seven carat. There's a specific size and uh, quality that uh, is required. Now, what's interesting is in Sri Lanka, we, uh, we uh, for the astrology, generally they wear a very dark blue stone. They call it kakanil. That means... No, we lost the, uh, the color of crow. So kaka is a crow and nil is blue. So it's a real color. And uh, so that's used for astrological purposes in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, and uh, what's interesting is in uh, India, wearing blue, uh, they generally don't wear because it's like very powerful. So uh, we have like uh, one of the most uh, popular celebrities uh, Mr. Amita Bachan uh, in India, uh, he's almost like a god uh, in India as a celebrity and actor. And he wears uh, the blue sapphire. He uh, 
he's wearing the blue sapphire and uh, so uh, uh, in the last we'll say one and a half years there's been a lot of requests for blue sapphires as well even out of india so it's yeah. it's interesting that the regionally people are using uh, and uh, from india people have been there there have been calls even for some very uh, big stones like 10 20 carat stones so which is very interesting because if they start wearing blue sapphire uh, for this purpose then there big, will be a big shortage very soon but you guys will be happy one way or the other people are selling yes. blue sapphire so for, for yes. the Sri Lankan yeah. trade it's good um, helen molesworth had asked what was the best early lesson that you learned in the field you know going back to your own history i think uh, um, it's about having to have some conventional learning which was i think very important especially if 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 you are looking at the business uh, and uh, wanting to be in the business and uh, i i think getting out of your comfort zone um the having to having the well, having the support to or, or well failing in uh, or buying those uh, stones where i lost money so yeah. which those uh, i think those and then not getting the right polish on the stone when you were uh, doing your first cut uh the facade going all the way out uh, yeah. and your table sitting somewhere else so those <laughs> i think those were some of the most uh, i i think those those really help you uh, or build your pillars uh, throughout life very nice I, it does seem like the worst mistakes you make end up being the best learning experiences that you have to look back upon <laughs> exactly yeah and uh, the last question in the queue was uh, just asking about the bear wall gem gem trading market and people in general um it wasn't really a specific question but just do you have anything can you say a little bit more either i guess both of you guys if you've been there um what is the story behind this specific market well you mean what you know what well going to berwada basically what i learn is um, as I, i think i i answered that already before is when you are not from the gym trade when you are not from the area when you go there you don't know anybody you find yourself in a funny situation how does it work so i i learn uh, you know visiting sri lanka and berwada in particular that um, number one thing that you have to do is you need a good friend somebody who knows the place somebody who can uh, you know organize a place for you to uh, look at stone and for you to uh, maybe buy them to do what you want to do in this area somebody who will filter the people who will come in because if not you will be surrounded by a crowd of 70 people but you know if you i like to work quietly i like to put my uh, loop and be able to take some note so you know somebody organize a room and the people are coming you know one by one showing you stone it's a great place but what to see many stone because in modern sri lanka you have stone from sri lanka but you have stone from many other places so if you go there you can find out within few days what is happening you know not only in sri lanka but also in madagascar in tanzania and in other if you are associated with the right people so i learned that i need to have a local contact i need to have a local contact who is in relation with the right people in uh, in the area and uh, and then who bring me the right people because if i spend you know if i go in the street and i'm surrounded by all the crooks of the area and everybody want to cheat me that will not be maybe the best experience but i found out that with amir with his help you know i will was able to uh, sit down in a in a in a good place a uh, quiet place i will be able to see people all the day and if i want to see spinel if i want to see safaya you know they will bring me stone and sometimes if i cannot communicate in the local language i mean we translate so the key point is for especially <clears throat> for people who want to uh, join this business and thing like that if you don't have a family in the friend 
in the if you don't have a family in the business, make friends. Find you know good local contact. Maybe it's the first time you go somewhere. You want to start a business dealing with Sri Lanka and Sapphire. Maybe start to go on a holiday in Sri Lanka. Make few friends. Learn about the people. Learn about the culture. Make some friends, and then these friends might be able to help you to uh, you know step by step going where you want to go. And you have to be able to learn from them. You have to be maybe open to new ideas and you will slowly and slowly build this idea and make something uh, that will work. This is the way we did with our meal. I started, uh, Vietnam was, in 2005, we started the field gemology program with Vietnam and uh, we had a lot of problems because we were not, I didn't have the, the right local contact to start with. My translator was not available. He was supposed to be there, but he was sick. So my normal translator didn't come. So I had nobody to translate. So we, we, we had a, a lot of issues. The driver was funny. When we moved to Sri Lanka, we said, OK, let's try to correct all the headache we had in Vietnam. And then, OK, we go with our meal. And, we, 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 and at the end of the trip, we said, OK, that's the right recipe. Uh, we need an arm, a guy like Army in every country we go in order to make our life easier, to put us in the contact with the right people so we can focus and on the stone and not just get disturbed by a series of problems or disasters that we have to deal with and that, uh, you know, will, uh, will be great adventure to tell. But actually, uh, regarding uh, going to the stone we wanted for the lab, that was uh, basically uh, uh, that was not the best way. Yeah, we wanted to be able to bring uh, good uh, samples, but not uh, just a story to tell and to frighten everybody away because we were not doing the right thing. So this is what I learned in Biruwara and uh, going with the uh, army there that you need to have good friends. Yeah, number one, if you don't have the right local contact, don't go. Yeah, or just look. Just look. Or just look and learn and make make friends. And then, you know, after a while, you know more about the stone, you know more about the place, you know more about the people, then you will find the right uh, person you want to work with. Yeah. And Armel, what about you? When, you? when you approach the gym market, do you have any special tactics or are you so good at it now you can move through it like it's uh, your own your own house? Yeah, so I think just in on the lighter side of things, uh, uh, you know, in, in Thailand, they say when they see a farang, they think it's an ATM machine. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it's, it's again, uh, how you can, uh, you know, what, what they're going to throw out at you, right? Uh, I remember some um, years ago in Chandaburi, we were buying uh, 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 yellow sapphires. And for the first four hours, we, we, we had said we don't want beridium treated, but for the first four hours, we only got beridium treated. And this is sitting with a friend who's very reputed in his office, right? But everyone just wanted to test us to see whether, you know, we knew what we were doing. So in terms of, uh, for I mean, for us, yes, because we have the process in place, uh, uh, it will be fine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if we'll say Vincent or you or a customer comes with us, we are very watchful. We are always watching for any indication that something's not right mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they are testing you at that point. Yeah, uh, They're testing not us, but the person who has come in with us, right? Yeah. So that's a similar situation what happened to me in Chandaburi. So we have sitting with a reputable dealer, uh, but they were testing us, right? Because we were unknown. So it's a very similar situation that can take place in the marketplace. And uh, so we are always watchful and especially to safeguard uh, our friends and customers who are with us in our office. Sounds great. And I think that's a really good place to leave it for tonight. I feel like we've said so much about the stones. You know, we saw the video so we can kind of imagine. We didn't really mention the food, but if anyone goes, they'll have to figure out for themselves that's really good. But um, you know, great people, great country, great, obviously great stones. Um, yeah, a lot of things to learn. A lot of things to learn from. Uh, actually, they, they are the masters. 
they yeah. are with the Burmese. The, the, the Sri Lankan are the masters for sapphire, like the Burmese are the masters for rubies. And uh, you have, uh, there is a lot to learn from them, yeah. the way they do. So yeah, if anyone's watching this and hasn't gone, whenever that opens up, go for it. It's a, it's a great country to visit, very hospitable, easy to, easy to communicate, I found, because a lot of people speak English, so it's, it's easy for Westerners to visit. So, okay, as, uh, as we're wrapping it up, I'm going to throw up our, our normal uh, ending screen. So I just want to say thanks to our mill for all the good stories and the wisdom and the advice. And um, if anybody is not following our mill, he has a variety of ways that you can connect with him on Instagram, on Facebook, several different websites. And of course, the, the final website is the, the new school boot camp program that he was speaking about, Gem Art Academy. So if you guys are interested in finding out more about that program, you can check that out there. Um, and then of course, yeah, if you're not following Vincent and I yet, what are you doing on Instagram? I don't know. But uh, yeah, Armel, thank you. It was a pleasure. We couldn't be there with you. So this was the next best thing to come to visit Sri Lanka for an evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, and, and thanks to all the guests. We had a, we had a nice big group tonight uh, and a lot of really nice questions. And uh, hopefully, um, if you, if, for anyone that had to leave early or if you missed the beginning, uh, it'll be up on YouTube in a, in a little bit. Um, so, Vincent, who are, we, who are we speaking to next week, just to give a little preview of what's going on next week? Well, next week, uh, we are still following, uh, you know, the process of uh, 2005. And uh, just after, you know, spending uh, about uh, three weeks with the uh, army and uh, people in Sri Lanka, we uh, went to uh, Madagascar. It was uh, very interesting because I realized that uh, most of the stones that I bought in the market in Ratnapura were actually coming from Madagascar. So I was cheated uh, quite a lot, uh, big time, when I went to uh, <laughs> the market <laughs> Because at this time, I had no experience about the rough in Sri Lanka. But we went to the market, I bought a few stones, then I went to see the mine. They were looking quite different from the stone from the mine. And then I went to the mine in Madagascar, and then I said, oh, okay. Uh, when I look at the stone going up from the mine in Madagascar, I say, okay, these are exactly the same stone that I bought in the market in Ratnapura. So then I, I know where at least my so-called Sri Lankan stone were coming from. So that, that, was, uh, that was quite fun. So... The next uh, guest will be uh, Nirina Rakutasana. And uh, Nirin is, uh, again, one of my old friends from 2005. And he is probably one of the most experienced sapphire miner, uh, if not the most experienced sapphire miner in uh, Madagascar. So Nirin has a very interesting background. He's a, actually, he's an uh, aeronautic engineer. He has a degree in... Uh, engineering uh, that he did in France. And uh, when he returned to Madagascar, he was caught, he, he was working in some business, he will tell you, and then he was caught in the sapphire storm. And uh, he's uh, working in uh, Ilakak. He was one of the first uh, Madagasy miner to, uh, to work in Ilakak. And uh, he started with a small mine and then he went to very big project and he mined a little bit uh, sapphire all over the, the place. So he has a very, very deep knowledge about uh, uh, mining sapphire in, uh, in Madagascar. So cool. it, it will be very interesting because this time it will not be a trader. He will not be a gemologist. He, this will be a miner, a gem miner. Okay, very cool. Okay, well, um, thanks again. And I, I, I wanted to just throw a little um, plug because I do, I do have this really cool article that I did last year about the history of uh, gem cutting in Sri Lanka that Armil and his father helped me do the research for. So um, at the bottom there, you see my website. If you guys are interested in finding out more about the history of cutting in Sri Lanka, um, that article is up on, on my website. So check that out if you're interested in the cutting part. Yep. And, uh, and we will be back again same time or about the same time next week with more great worldwide adventure. Nirina is okay with, it will be the same time, probably eight o'clock uh, Bangkok time. And for two or three hours, we are going to uh, speak about gem mining, uh, sapphire mining in Madagascar. Cool. Be fun. 
Okay, Armel. Well, until our borders are open again and I can either see you in Bangkok or maybe I'll catch you in Colombo, um, thank you and see you later. See you, Armel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.